Hello, my friends. And thank you so much for coming to spend part of your Wednesday, April 17th with me. It is 2024. And we have concluded the second day of jury selection in the Karen Reed trial out of Dedham, Massachusetts. Norfolk County, Massachusetts in the house. Hello. Hello. Who is everyone today? My goodness. Uh, it's been two days, huh? Well, my latest update indicates that 11 jurors have been seated by the end of today. And so, five more to go. We need 12 in the jury box and four alternates for a total of 16. So I think by the end of tomorrow, which is Thursday, we will have everybody seated and then trial should start Monday, right? Didn't they say no jurors on Friday or are they going to start the trial Friday? Anybody know? Anybody know? Oh, I have the jury questionnaire. We're going to look at that. So none your ship business. Don't you worry. It'll be your ship business today because we're going to look at it. We're going to look at the other filings, too. We're going to look at some last-minute discovery that the Commonwealth dropped, shockingly. We're going to look at the witness list. We are going to look at the defendant's supplemental response to the motion in limine regarding the testimony of, I believe, Sergeant Lank, the bad act testimony that they wanted to talk about, about the Lapalito brothers. And... Um, they went through, I think, 100 jurors today, and I think something like 90 yesterday. And we had some friends outside the courthouse sending me pictures. I'm going to put up some pictures from you, for, you, for, the little, for you so that you can uh, see what the boots on the ground were like. And she said she didn't even want credit for these pictures, but these pictures are pretty awesome. And apparently today... The crowd was a little bit lighter, she said. Eileen said. <laughs> Thank you, Eileen and Kevin, for sending me these pictures. Um, she said today there were two to three police officers for every supporter. That's the kind of police presence that was there today. So that was very interesting. I watched Tom's CPU this morning outside of court, and I saw... Um, Larry, the DUI guy, was there, and um, it's like parade of stars. I feel like I need to come up there and go, come to court on Monday, although I don't want to drive all the way there and then find out that I can't get into the courthouse. That would be a bummer, um, but I really would like to go at least one day and sit in there. Thank you so much to my early supporters who are Reaching out before the stream even starts. Maureen, Lizzie, Angela, Justin, another Melanie. You guys are awesome and you really support the channel before we even get there. Yes, Melanie, come. Yes, Melanie, come. It's easy for me. I just take a ferry. Just hop on the ferry to New London and it's like a straight shot from there. So let's take a look. Let me see these pictures from this morning. Now, there were obviously there were these pictures are not from the courthouse. Um, these are from our friends who were outside the courthouse. Within, you know, all the way, 200 feet away for sure. There's your friends. Let me just uh, take this down for one second and get it in a proper format for you so you can see it better. How many of you were there today? Can't wait to hear all about it. Well, I guess this is the best it's gonna wanna do for me, hold on. All right. This is these are these pictures are from today. Boots on the ground, on the scene outside the courthouse. Pretty, pretty, pretty cool. 
See anybody you know in this picture? Two hundred feet away. They had signs up on the orange barriers that say restricted area, no free speech beyond this point. You guys were out there in full force. Some great shots. The world is watching, my friends. The world is watching. Restricted area, no free speech beyond this point. <laughs> Scotland in the house. Hello, Scotland. I love my Scottish viewers. You guys are amazing. The Scots are here. Hi, Katie. Thanks so much for your super chat. Um, for those of you who are new here, welcome. My name is Melanie Little, and I am a New York State trial lawyer with 30 years experience in state and federal courts. I am not a cupcake because I can't make everyone happy. I have opinions and I'm going to share them. And I'm also a mother of five. So that gives me a whole lot of different perspectives to come to you with. And I started covering this case because like many of you, I fell into the rabbit hole of the Karen Reed case. You can call me Alice. And I couldn't get out. And it was so controversial and it's still very controversial. So if you are just starting to watch this case now, I'm just going to say be very careful where you watch it. Because if you go onto the mainstream media chats like Law and Crime or Court TV, you might find it's not as moderated as you would like it to be. And you may be attacked. I don't know. You can ask some people in my chat. Uh, we keep it classy here. We don't do the cursy words. We don't do the trash talk. We don't do the bullying. And uh, that's the way we like it. So. Not a cupcake, sorry. Um, I have been on Court TV about this case. They haven't called me on lately because <laughs> I guess I have opinions that are too strong and maybe I know too much. And when I'm on panels with other people that don't seem to know a lot about this case, um, I don't know. It, it kind of makes it, it, I, I, it was fine. When I was on, what was I on where um, I was the most knowledgeable? I want to say maybe surviving the survivor. Um. And I, I was just called on to speak more than the others, and I kind of felt bad. But uh, if you are starting to watch this now, also be careful where you watch the coverage, because mainstream media, who is just starting to cover it, much of mainstream media that is just starting to cover it. In fact, uh, I posted on my community page a video from Fox Live from yesterday, and it was so wrong from Jump. They were calling John O'Keefe Karen Reed's husband, and I think a lot of you guys went on there and commented not only on my community post, but on the actual video itself, because this is one of those cases where you really need to know what the facts are and what the court documents show and what the investigative reports show. And if you're not fully familiar with them and you make a misstep, um, people, people get mad. <laughs> people get mad. And uh, I was quoted in the New York Post yesterday in the article, so maybe some of you found me from there. And if you did, uh, welcome. You're really, I think you're going to like it here. And that's that. We have a lot of locals in here from the Canton area, from uh, Norfolk County. And I think you guys, I, I did. Somebody asked me, is it really true you got st uh, stricken yesterday? And I think I did because, you know, I don't curse on this channel. And I think it's because the way I pronounce Norfolk, and that is the way to pronounce it, right? So I think maybe AI picked that up as the F word in the first five minutes of the stream. And uh, it was, a, it was a situation. So um, yeah, I saw some other people covering it too. And there are some people that are going to jump into live streaming it that have never covered the case before. And you know, that's everyone, there's a place for everyone on YouTube. It's going to get me all in a bunch, but um so let's take a look. We have, so jury selection started yesterday. I know that cameras were not allowed in and we discussed this and that's why I didn't go live yesterday. I know some of you were sad because you want to come hang out, but there, not a whole lot happened yesterday. So I wanted to wait until today until the documents were out until we had some other stuff to look at so that we could make it into a whole big show. And so we're going to look at the initial portion of jury selection that was televised. It was only uh, the judges like I think they had some argument at the beginning or she 
ruled on something at the beginning that we're going to talk about. And then she did her sort of statement of the case to the jury. And then she reads a whole lot of jury instructions that I think are boring. So um, we don't really need to uh, go over that. But after that, then we will go to the documents. We'll look at the documents and uh, we will see. We will see what we think is going to happen. But my, my guess is they're going to wrap jury selection tomorrow. Oh, yeah. So did anybody tell me if they're going to start Friday or if they're closed on Fridays or what goes on? Monday was a holiday. It was Patriots Day and also the Boston Marathon. That's why there was no court on Monday. No fuck. No fuck. <laughs> no fuck. Oh, people are trying to catch up. Oh, Kristen. Welcome. Welcome. I have over 50 hours of video analysis on this channel. And that's not including the hours that I put into it on my own. So I am into this whole very, very deep. Call me Alice. And Sean McDonough, who's an amazing, nice, really nice guy, former federal agent, has um, was also quoted in the New York Post article. And he has spent, he said, he estimated 15 hours a day just investigating this case on his own with his fellow retired law enforcement friends. So... Yeah, Suzanne, I figured out that is what it was. I know. I'm sorry. That's just the way it's pronounced. And I know that it's pronounced that way because you know why. I don't need to go through that again, but you guys know why. All right. So um, let's go to court. Let's go to Judge Canoni's courtroom. I'd love to hear your thoughts when we're done. Uh, thank you, Scott, for sending this to me. I did find the other uh, coverage on Boston 10, but it, it, that has a little bit clipped off. This is a bit a, a bit more. This has about three more minutes on it. We're not going to get a whole lot, but just let me know that you can hear this okay. And this was yesterday morning in Judge Canoni's courtroom before the jurors were brought in. In this case, I'll give... It's, I know it starts right in the middle of her sentence, but that's all we got. The last sentence, I'm not going to give the other sentence because Ms. Reed's presumed innocent and has no burden of proof and I would be assigning her a burden of proof and I'm not going to do that. Wow. <laughs> the first time I've heard her say that. Ms. Reed is presumed innocent, but um, good. Yay. Finally. Um, based on the offer of proof on Friday, I am well within my rights uh, pursuant to the case law to exclude the third party culprit defense. Again, again, them's fighting words, judge, them's fighting words. You are well within your rights to do that. But if you do do that and you prevent them from being able to put up a third party culprit defense, you are setting yourself up for an appellate issue and you know it. So I, I don't really like the way she, um, right away, we're going to get into it. I, I don't really like the way that she um, phrases this. It's, it's unnecessary. It's well within my right to preclude you from doing that, but I'm not going to do it. Okay. Well, you can, but you'd be setting yourself up for an appeal. So I don't know how you guys feel about that. I thought it was unnecessary. I'm not going to do that now. I'm going to give you a chance to develop it through relevant, competent, admissible evidence, but you cannot open on it. So that's my ruling on that. Uh, Okay. I just want to make sure you understand what that means. Cause I, I know there were some questions and there were some questions in the comments and some questions in the chat and there's a lot of, on the twittiots are all blabbering about it. Um, so here's what she means. She will allow them to elicit evidence of third party culprits and through cross-examination, through calling witnesses, but they're not allowed to open on it. And that's perfectly fine. They don't need to open on it. They don't need to open at all. They could save their opening. They could reserve their opening until they put on their case. And sometimes defense attorneys do that as a strategy. So they let the prosecution open and then they say, we will, you know, we'll reserve our opening. And then they'll let the prosecution put on their case. And then they will open before the start of their case. In this, in this case, it might be, it might be a good strategy because that way, based on what happens during the prosecution's case, and you'll see their list of witnesses, it's going to go on for, Lally said, I think four to, four to five weeks, their case. They may be able to elicit evidence, credible evidence, actual real evidence of a possible third party culprit or culprits. And then when they open, they will be able to say that in their opening. So what she's trying to prevent is uh, a mistrial based on their opening saying, 
the evidence is going to show that this person, this person, and this person really are the ones that murdered John O'Keefe, Officer, Officer John O'Keefe, and that here's exactly what happened, and then not be able to prove that or even introduce any evidence to that effect, in which case there could be a mistrial, and nobody wants a mistrial in this case against the defense. If there is a mistrial in this case against the prosecution, Jeopardy, after Jeopardy attaches, it would be highly unlikely that she would be tried, that Karen Reed would be tried again. So that's trial strategy 101. And that's perfectly fine, as long as they're allowed to elicit the evidence that they need to elicit. And I think based on everything that we know, those of us that have been following this case for over two years, and all of the documents that we've read together and all of the hearings that we've watched and all the motions that we've argued and listened to them argue, I think that they are going to be able to show evidence of a possible other scenario that happened other than Karen Reed not hitting jo Officer John O'Keefe with her car. Okay? So don't everybody get all upset about that. I think that's the right ruling. We're just going to see how she how she goes about that. If she's going to start precluding things that they want to introduce or questions that they want to ask. But um, panel voir dire. Hi, junk man. Uh, panel voir dire is when you you question a whole panel of people at once instead of individually. And that's what she said. She said she's not doing that. So it's just there's individual voir dire and there's panel voir dire. So we are not in the courtroom for jury selection. So we do not know if anyone here in the chat has been sitting in the courtroom for jury selection, you can let me know how it's going in there. But they already have 11 jurors seated, so they're moving pretty quickly. Um, there was a Massachusetts attorney in my, I think she was in my comments. I don't know if you're here tonight. If you are, welcome. And she said it took something like three weeks just to pick a jury in a slip and fall case last month. So it can take a long time. Uh, and the fact that they've already seated almost three quarters of the jury in two days, that's uh, that's really, really good because so many people have heard about this case. And it doesn't matter if they've heard about the case. Uh, the voir dire is just to make sure that they can still keep an open mind about the case and that they don't have bias or they haven't already made up their mind um, on one side or the other, or that, and to make sure that they don't know any of the players involved or any of the witnesses involved, and that they didn't go to high school with any of the people that um, are witnesses in this case. And that's that's really what this is about. As long as somebody can be open-minded, just because they've heard about the case is not enough to keep them off the jury. So let's let them uh, finish up because <laughs> at the rate that I talk, we're gonna be here for four hours. I would like to see counsel at sidebar about the supplemental questionnaire. Okay, so they're just going to keep their camera on Karen this whole time. And wasn't that part of the media order that they weren't supposed to be zooming in on the defendant on her phone like they did that one day? And we saw that on Larry, the DUI guy stream. But uh, we're going to fast forward through this. A lot of people who are anti-Karen seem to be anti-Karen because they just don't like her facial expressions. And they think she has a smirk on her face. And they think that that must mean that she murdered her boyfriend. Oh, that other thing last night on uh, Fox Live, Live Fox, whatever it was that I posted on my community page. The legal analyst who they had on that show also said, and she was, she's, charged with manslaughter, which is not true. She is charged with second degree murder, which requires malice or intent. So I'm just saying it was all wrong. This is a murder case. Originally, she was charged with manslaughter in February of 2022, right after Officer John O'Keefe was killed. But then after convening a state grand jury, they upgraded the charges in June of 2022 to murder, second degree murder, and a couple of other charges like leaving the scene of an accident, yada, yada, yada. But it is a murder case. And that is why the world is watching. Well, it's one of the reasons. Put that on the bingo card, that beeping of whatever that is. I don't know if it's, it's their Zoom feed. I don't know what it is.
all three things. Oh, and then you know what? I think that's where this one cuts off. All right, I got to switch the video. But I just wanted to you to see that initial um, ruling so that we could discuss it because I know a lot of people had questions about it. All right. So Chrissy says, I would smirk also when my attorney finally made points after two damn years of abuse. And listen, um, you know, we would not be here if Karen Reed was not a woman of means, a successful woman who's a financial, she's a financial analyst. She does something in finance. She's also a professor at Bentley. I don't know that she can do either of those things right now while this has been going on for the last two years because she doesn't even have a car. Uh, Diana, I'm, I, um, hi, I can't slow the chat, you guys. You know why? Because the, the chat helps the algorithm. Just do the best that you can, all right? I'm not going to hold it against anyone. Um, if the moderators are not able to control the trolls, but um, the speed of the chat helps the algorithm. And this is so important that I really want it out there. So I know you guys are doing the best you can. Just, just do the best you can. All right. We can always go back there later. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, we got to do it. This is the way we got to do it because we were shadow banned yesterday because of Norfolk County. And uh, my Oklahoma stream was also shadow banned. So I don't know. It's not about the money for me. You know that. This is about getting the word out and getting people educated and up to speed on this case. So let's go. Good morning again, counsel. Good morning again, Ms. Reed. Good morning, jurors. My name is Beverly Canoni. I'm a judge of this court, and I want to welcome you here this morning. Jury service, as you know, is one of the most important duties that we have as citizens. Our system of justice simply would not work without you, and we appreciate that you're here today, ready, willing, and able to serve if called upon to do so. So you we're are unmuted. We're selecting a jury today in a criminal case that you just heard, Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. The Commonwealth question, because I heard that you are muted thing. I have the judge's personal Zoom login information and it didn't work yesterday. So was there a new secret, super secret login that people had to have to watch this on Zoom? Because um, her regular Zoom didn't work. Hey, Will. Hi the glare in the house my stream last night was really wonky too couldn't hit the like and only few were showing up in chat oh that's weird the numbers were off yes snow catfish i did think maybe that was the problem did think that could have been the problem i'm not even going to read it because i don't want to give anybody any ideas but who knows you know i mean listen anybody who has any logical train of thought that looks at the evidence the way we have have with an analytical mind is uh, uh, coming to the conclusion that there's no way that she hit him with her car. The evidence does not line up. It just doesn't. And it's not about accusing someone else of killing him. It's about the fact that she did not. She did not. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see it. So I don't know what happened with her, um, with her Zoom stuff, but free Billy Tibbetts. That's all I got to say. Both alleges that on the morning of January 29th, 2022, at approximately 6.04 a.m., the Canton Police Department received a 911 call reporting an unresponsive male party in the snow outside a residence at 34 Fairview Road within their town. Officers responded and discovered the male party, later identified as John O'Keefe, off the roadway in the front lawn area. Officers identified three women with Mr. O'Keefe, one of whom was the defendant, Karen Reed, the girlfriend of Mr. O'Keefe. The defendant had been with Mr. O'Keefe the previous evening at two different bars in Canton and had driven with him to his residence in the early morning hours of this date. Mr. O'Keefe was treated by paramedics from the Canton Fire Department and transported to the Good Samaritan Medical Center where he was later pronounced deceased. The Commonwealth alleges that the defendant struck Mr. O'Keefe with her vehicle earlier that morning and then left the scene while Mr. O'Keefe lay injured in the snow during a blizzard. 
The defendant denies that she has committed these or any crimes alleged in this case, and she has pled not guilty. So the defendant is charged, as you've heard, with second degree murder and also charged with manslaughter while operating under the influence and leaving the scene after causing personal injury or death. I will describe these crimes in detail at the end of the case when I teach the jury the law, but briefly, murder is the unlawful killing of a human being. In order to prove the defendant guilty of second degree murder, the Commonwealth must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed an unlawful killing and that it was done with malice. In comparison, involuntary slaughter is an unintentional, unlawful killing caused by wanton or reckless conduct. These terms and the elements of the crimes will be explained to you in detail at the end of the case before you begin your deliberations. Just so you know, malice equals intent. Some people means it, think it means evil. It does, evil, intent. With malice means you intended to do it. It's not an accident. Now, at the outset, I would like to address the issue of public interest in this case and the duty of this court to adhere to the rule of law. Duty. John Adams said that we are a government of laws, not of men, and that the law must be deaf to the clamoring of the public. He meant that while public opinion about a given subject may ebb and flow, the law must be steady, reliable, and even-handed. We know that in the subject... Deaf to the public? Is that why she put the, the public 2,200 feet away from the courthouse and said they could not use bullhorns because she idolizes John Adams? Okay. Okay. I think that I think we're getting a little more insight into her. Of this case, there are people advocating for one outcome or another with intensity, but without the benefit of having heard or seen any evidence at all. Wow. I just want to tell you that um, if there's any Massachusetts attorneys that can uh, correct me on this, I'm going to say that's not part of the pattern jury instructions, Your Honor. That is not part of the pattern jury instructions. That's what we call them in New York that you would read to the jury. She picked that quote intentionally. So I want to roll that back. Uh, if any Massachusetts attorneys are in the chat, they can tell me, no, no, they say this in every single time before they uh, start questioning a jury before the voir dire. Please tell me. But I'm, I think she selected this quote. But without reason, the benefit of a message. We know that in the subject of this case, there are people advocating for one outcome or another, even handed. Steady. About a given subject may ebb and flow. John Adams, quoting John Adams. The clamoring of the man. Come on. John Adams said that we are a government of laws, not of men, and that the law must be deaf to the clamoring of the public. He meant that while public opinion about a given subject may ebb and flow, the law must be steady, reliable, and even-handed. We know that in the subject of this case, there are people advocating for one outcome or another with intensity, but without the benefit of having heard or seen any evidence at all. The law works in a different way, and the difference is crucial to our system of justice. The jurors selected for this trial will hear and judge the evidence. They will decide what the facts are and where the evidence is contested, they will determine where the truth lies. Ultimately, the jury will decide whether the Commonwealth has carried its burden of proving that the defendant is guilty of any crime beyond a reasonable doubt and to a moral certainty. People outside of this building have rights and we know that they have voices, but this criminal trial will be decided by an independent jury free from outside interference based only upon the evidence presented in this courtroom and the law. This is the only way to ensure that every person who comes before the court receives a fair trial. It is just that simple and that important. So while public comment will likely continue, the rule of law will be upheld. Okay. Um, did she not, she did not call him Officer O'Keefe, right? I, I need to watch that again because somebody's pointing out that she's also said it was they went to O'Keefe's residence. Hold on a second. 
I mean, did she really get it that wrong? And we appreciate that you are unmuted. We're selecting a jury today in a criminal case that you just heard, Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. The Commonwealth alleges that on the morning of January 29th, 2022, at approximately 6.04 a.m., the Canton Police Department received a 911 call reporting an unresponsive male party in the snow outside a residence at 34 Fairview Road within their town. Here's what the phone call said, because we heard it. There's a man passed out in the snow. And that phone call was made by Officer John O'Keefe's friend of more than a decade, who is now laying dead on her sister's front lawn. And I do believe she said 32 Fairview because when she called, she called it in. Obviously, Canton PD knows that the owner of that home is a Boston police officer, the Canton deputy chief lives across the street on the same street. There's a man passed out in the snow. Not like, holy crap, officer down, using profanities. No freaking out. It's very telling. It's very telling. In my opinion. Officers responded and discovered the male party, later identified as John O'Keefe. Not Boston police officer John O'Keefe. Not Officer John O'Keefe. Just John O'Keefe. And we've talked about this a hundred times too, but I'm going to say it a bit louder for those in the back. When an officer, a brother in blue, is killed in New York, everything stops. It doesn't matter if it's on the job or not. And his or her fellow brothers and sisters in blue will do everything they can to make sure that that killing is solved. The I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and the thing is like, it, not that everything else takes a backseat to it, but my moderators in the chat will tell you because they, many of them are retired law enforcement, NYPD homicide, sergeants, detectives, that the fact that they still, on the day of jury selection, cannot refer to him as Officer O'Keefe really makes me mad. We are outraged. Because they're trying to deflect from the attention, trying to deflect attention from the fact that Officer John O'Keefe was a, a brother in blue. Found dead on the front lawn of another brother in blue, whose brother also was a brother in blue from Canton PD. And that most of the witnesses are either federal agents with the ATF or Massachusetts State Police or Canton PD. And that's why this judge ruled that nobody, not only can nobody in the courtroom wear any t-shirt that says, anything about the case or support for either side or even a button that says justice for JJ, but any police officers who are even just sitting in the gallery observing the trial are not allowed to come in uniform and witnesses who are law enforcement are not allowed to testify in uniform. That is the law of the courtroom of Judge Canoni of the Norfolk County Court, Norfolk Superior Court, sorry, in Massachusetts. So, you know, First Amendment issues, at least, <laughs> at least it should outrage you too. But a lot of people just seem to think this is totally cool. Off the roadway in the front lawn area, officers identified three women with Mr. O'Keefe, one of whom was the defendant, Karen Reed, the girlfriend of Mr. O'Keefe. The defendant had been with Mr. O'Keefe the previous evening at two different bars in Canton and had driven with him to his residence in the early morning hours of this date. Mr. O'Keefe was treated by paramedics. Driven with him to his residence? 
Wait, is that what she just said? Because that's incorrect. That's incorrect. Did she re-instruct them? Hold on. Reed, the girlfriend of Mr. O'Keefe. The defendant had been with Mr. O'Keefe the previous evening at two different bars in Canton and had driven with him to his residence in the early morning hours of this date. That's, this is like already a problem. I hope she corrected this. Suzanne, are you surprised? I mean, I'm not going to say she lied. She misspoke, obviously, um, because they agreed on what she was going to say. They had to agree on the summary of the case. These are the only things that are um, agreed upon. So I'm not going to call her a liar, but this is definitely a misspeaking. So she she has um, she did not she has not corrected this statement. I don't even know they're they're paying attention right now. The defense attorneys to trying their case. They they might not have even pick this up. Mindy, have you been in, in court both days and it has not been corrected? It's a problem. Wow. Factually incorrect. No, she didn't correct it. Arson, have you been in, in court as well? That's uh, interesting because there were no cameras in the courtroom today. So we did not see what happened today. All we got to see was, was this yesterday. This is from yesterday. If you're turning, if you're just tuning in, Hey, Wendy, I sent you a wrench. <laughs> Aren't you happy? <laughs> She's like, uh Oh, Mel's mad. <laughs> you know how I get about these things that upsets me, that, but that's a major misstatement of the facts of this case. So the jury's thinking, okay, so the people who don't know about this case are thinking, Oh, she drove back with John to John's house. And then what? She ran him over at his house? Hmm. Mr. O'Keefe was treated by paramedics from the Canton Fire Department and transported to the Good Samaritan Medical Center, where he was later pronounced deceased. The Commonwealth alleges that the defendant struck Mr. O'Keefe with her vehicle earlier that morning and then left the scene while Mr. O'Keefe lay injured in the snow during a blizzard. Well, now they think the scene is at the house because she they, she said she took she drove him back to his house in the early morning hours. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to call a mistrial on day two, but, uh, you know, hopefully it's been corrected, maybe in questioning. I, I don't know. Easton's Mimi says, like Jackson said to a reporter today, words matter. Yeah, yeah, they do, especially when it's something as as basic as that. that that's that's a made. So now they're thinking the scene. Oh, the scene must be at his house. She must have driven him home to his house and then hit him before they went in the house. Huh. OK. Twilight's own time. The defendant denies that she has committed these or any crimes alleged in this case, and she has pled not guilty. So the defendant is charged, as you've heard, with second degree murder and also charged with manslaughter while operating under the influence and leaving the scene after causing personal injury or death. I will describe these crimes in. So second degree murder and manslaughter so they can find one or the other. Second degree murder requires malice, which is intent. And manslaughter is reckless disregard detail at the end of the case when I teach the jury the law, okay. but briefly. You're not going to teach the jury the law. This is not law school. You will instruct them on the law. You don't teach them the law. Where are my Massachusetts attorneys? Please tell me I'm not crazy. She's not going to teach them the law. She's going to instruct them on the law. And that's why during voir dire, one of the main questions is, at the end of this case, the judge is going to instruct you on the law. Are you going to be able to follow the law even if you do not agree with the law? And they have to say yes. Wow, wow, wow. Murder is the unlawful killing of a human being. In order to prove the defendant guilty of second degree murder, the Commonwealth must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed an unlawful killing and that it was done with malice. In comparison, involuntary slaughter is an unintentional, unlawful killing caused by wanton 
or reckless conduct. These terms and the elements of the crimes will be explained to you in detail at the end of the case before you begin your deliberations. Now, at the outset, I would like to address the issue of public interest in this case and the duty of this court to... Duty. She keeps saying duty. Uh -huh. All right. You know, I don't like foul language on this uh, channel, but sometimes we have to laugh. Otherwise, we're just going to cry. Words are huge, Debbie. Yeah, they are. Cammie says, oh, we're going to talk about that. There was a sidebar because Ted Daniels of Boston 25 was live tweeting from the courtroom all day. So I was following that too. And he said that there was a sidebar. And uh, that I think it was Yanetti that got up to the podium and said, I, I need a sidebar. I have something very, very, very important to say. And then they did a little sidebar. And uh, you're saying Gretchen Voss was there and she was kicked out. That's interesting because none of the witnesses are supposed to be allowed to sit in the gallery until after they testify. So I thought there was going to be something else that he was talking about. Um, but that's whack. Um, and I just picked that up just now when we watched it. And that's why I wanted to watch it again. So I'm sorry if you've already watched it 10 times, but I think we picked up some interesting points saying that she drove with John to his house in the early morning hours. And then she hit him at the scene with her car. Um, no, that's not what happened. Thank you, Joyce, for becoming a member. Sarah, for becoming a member. Mystique, for being a member for six months, who says, awesome, Bruce, it peeps right here. Classy. We try. We try and keep it classy. Hi, Della. You and I love you and your commentary. Justice for Officer O'Keefe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justice for Officer O'Keefe. Thank you for your super chat. And another one. I only support the classy, as says Della Sandor. Go, Melanie, go. Thank you, Della. I appreciate that. We try. Uh, Mike Dorado, thank you so much for your super chat. I just started watching your videos and I really enjoyed them. You're doing an amazing job. I found another law tuber I enjoy. Thank keep it up. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm pretty new to this game. I only started this channel. My own, I started posting my own content in July of 2023. So we're growing quickly. About nine months ago, nine months ago, right? We're in our infancy. Before that, you may recognize me from being a frequent guest host on Duty Ron and Police Off the Cuff, where I was a legal analyst for two channels that are uh, run by retired NYPD law enforcement detectives, homicide detectives. So I was the legal analyst on those channels for a while. So it's not like, you know, I've been here forever and you just found me. So welcome. Katie Fisher, thank you so much from Edinburgh, Scotland. This case is insane. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. And it's worldwide. It is worldwide. Uncle Fredo, thank you so much for the 20 beans for the super sticker. I'm sorry that you were the um, unloved brother in The Godfather, but um, that is a fantastic screen name. Getting up there to compete with Nanya Ship Business and... Helena Handbasket, who was in here yesterday. <laughs> Put that on your bingo card. Buzzing for Truth, thank you so much for your super chat. Melanie, you're a rock star and you get it. Remember in the Maya trial, Greg Anderson kept saying they just don't get it. I feel like that here too. Like they just don't get it. Della, another one coming in hot. You reveal documents and truth without being biased. You're a huge part of this. You're lovely and intelligent in the long kudos, New York Post. Thanks, Alice. Oh, thank you. You are so sweet. You're so sweet. Monica, thanks for your super chat. Uh, you were going to make my evening walk go very fast and probably much longer <laughs> listening to the show. Thank you for all that you do for us. Free Karen Reed. Hey, look, if I can contribute to your exercise program, I'm here for it. Stephanie, thank you so much for gifting five memberships. You are always so very generous. Robert, thank you for your super sticker. And Danielle, happy birthday. Danielle says the Melanie stream about Karen Reed on my birthday. All is right in the world today. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Danielle, for always being a staunch supporter of me and this channel. And we love having you here. Uh, Shelby say, what? Thanks for becoming a member. A web Weaver, thanks for being a member. Says, speak it, Melanie. Super chat from CE. Thank you so much. Karen often spoiled her boyfriend's niece and enjoyed spending time girl bonding with a poor girl with no mother over preschool Duncan. What a witch. Yeah. And bought, bought her expensive clothes. And, and she was actually an orphan. Both of her parents died. So for those of you who, who don't know the story, 
Officer John O'Keefe's sister passed away tragically. I think she had some sort of illness. And right after she passed away, about three months later, her husband died. So John became the guardian of his niece and nephew. I don't know if he ever legally adopted them. I think he did. Um, but he took them in as his, as his own. And he had been raising his niece and nephew for about eight years. And I believe he and Karen had been dating for around two years when this happened, but they had dated in the past and then they sort of reconnected. Um, but yeah, that's what they're going to point to as motive. There was a fight. Apparently somebody's going to come in and testify that on the morning before Karen intentionally murdered John with her car, uh, they had a fight because John was upset that Karen took his niece to Dunkin' Donuts on the way to school and bought her a nice coffee. And they're going to have other witnesses come in and testify that, um, you know, John wanted the kids to grow up a more simple life. And he didn't like the fact that she was spoiling them and buying them expensive gifts and clothes. And, um, you know, that was the apparent bone of contention that caused her to want to murder him. In addition to uh, an alleged trip in Aruba that happened uh, on New Year's Eve, about three, a little over three weeks before this, uh, that we can probably talk some more about today because I think we have some information on that. But yeah, you're hundred percent right. And the people who are coming in here and watching this for the first time are like, what? That's their motive. Yeah, that's their motive. Um, Michael, thank you so much for gifting five memberships. You guys are awesome. YouTube distributes them randomly. I have no control over who gets them. So congratulations. And Jam Cracker, thank you for your 10 bucks and for t telling people or instructing people uh, if they'd like to slow the chat on their phone, you can touch the chat to pause and you can scroll up and down. On a PC, click the chat area with your mouse to pause and scroll up and down. Thank you, Jam Cracker, for that and for letting the viewers know that. And Della, and again, like for the 15th time today, again, with another 10, she needs to read Federalist Papers, John Adams. U.S. needs to get rid of appointed judges and revert to voted in by the public. She didn't write this. She read it. Disgusting. Worst judge ever. Ever. Hi, Patronus Glow. She's amazing. You're an amazing moderator. An amazing moderator. Harry Potter fan. Member for six months. And again, happy birthday, Danielle Alexander. Patty Murphy, will you consider selling stickers? I am outraged. Oh, you know what? I designed a couple of them. I actually designed them. I think stickers would be good. Because the designs that I did probably wouldn't look great on a t-shirt. So yeah, I could totally do that. Mm -hmm. They're all ready to go. I just got to put them in my shop. Awesome. Great idea, Patty Murphy. Thank you so much. You guys are just amazing. And Mary, thank you for your super sticker. Okay. You guys are so generous that it takes a long time to go through those. But, you know, my mother always taught me to write thank you notes. And so I must thank each and every one of you whom I love so very much because you helped me realize that I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm not. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the discovery um, that was just dropped by the Commonwealth on the 10th. On the 10th. Does anybody remember that? Um, okay, I'm going to make a reference right now uh, where this guy, uh, it was like these puppets. I want to see if you can guess this guy. Okay. It was a show and it was like these puppets on a show. And, uh, uh, what had happened was I had went to ma mail the bill, but I didn't. And then it was, he said something like, well, you should have, we, you were supposed to, you should have sent it on the 10th, on the 10th. And they were like, well, whose fault is that? Anybody remember that? So that was a bad impression, but, um, but if anybody can guess what it is, it was a TV show with some puppets and it was pretty funny. You should have sent, you should have sent it on the 10th. I'll wait for it. I'll wait for it. I'll watch the chat. All right. Um, let's see. We're going to go to the Commonwealth's notice for discovery. No, it was not Mr. Rogers. Twas not Mr. Rogers. Twas not Fraggle Rock. I know somebody knows the answer to this. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you if you don't know. Don't worry. I'll, I'm going to tell you. Here's the Commonwealth's notice of discovery. It's not Fire of the Rock. Yes. Yes, it was Crank Yankers. Yes, it was Crank Yankers. Hayden Kane in coming in for the win. Jason right behind. Jason right behind with Crank Yankers. Wasn't that the funniest show? That's like up there with that skit. Um, <laughs> Olivia, did you know which one I was talking about? 
the skit of um was it key and peel or i don't remember but it was like he's a teacher and he's calling on the students he's taking attendance and he's like hey aaron are you here hey aaron jaquelin jaquelin are you here jaquelin and the kids are looking around like um jacqueline <laughs> and then he starts, it's a lit one of the other funniest skits that i've heard yep it was crank yankers that redhead thank you thank you so much thank you thank you thank you so much a, a Ron, it is Key and Peel. It is, it is. Yes, you know what I'm talking about, Will, right? A, a Ron, Jaqueline, Jaqueline, um, Aaron. Yeah, we are all cray cray. I know this. Like after a while, when you get into this hole, you get it's like it's like being in solitary confinement. It's like you're one of the crumblies. You've been in solitary confinement for you know. I don't know. How long were they in solitary for before they even had their trials? Like over two years, 23 hours a day. That's what it feels like. All right. But I digress. Okay. Onward. This is the notice of discovery that is dated April 10th. And these are things that the, uh, as such, Commonwealth just decided to turn over to the defense. Uh, for those of you who are not following this case and you're like, what the hell is a Commonwealth? Well, Massachusetts does not call itself itself a state, calls itself the Commonwealth. So when you're watching other trials, um, for example, Crumbly, it was the state of Michigan against Jennifer Crumbly. If you're in New Hampshire, the state of Montgomery versus, I mean, the state of Montgomery, the state of New Hampshire versus that of Montgomery. Uh, in Massachusetts and some other states, like I think Virginia and Pennsylvania, they are called the Commonwealth. So it just basically means the state. All right. So here's other things that they just turned over. And you know I'm a stickler for spelling. But um, right in number one, the copy of Massachusetts State Police body-worn camera video. Body-worn, W-A-R-N. Uh, it should be spelled W-O-R-N. Body-worn, like you wear it on your body. It's not a body-worn, like it's warning you about something. But again, I digress. And I'm not sure. <laughs> exactly which body worn camera this is but i think this is the body worn camera that catches sergeant good saying at 6 a.m or 6 whatever 6 30 a.m i'm gonna section her about karen reed that is my doesn't anyone but you know here's the thing about spell check martha if spell check wouldn't pick that up because worn is actually a word but yeah, doesn't anybody proofread it? Doesn't, shouldn't like, shouldn't like four people be proofing this before it goes out and becomes a public document? Again, misplaced comma right here. Copy of Massachusetts State Police, comma, body-worn camera. So is that two things or one? It's, I think that's one thing. And I think, well, wait, if it's Sergeant Good, that would be Canton Police. Oh, it's the body-worn camera video that they showed in court that Lally said, Karen said, I saw Brian Albert and Colin Albert smash John's head into the taillight. And then the judge called his bluff and says, we're going to play that video in court right now so you can show me. And it did not say that at all. It said, Karen said, are you guys all in on the same joke? And then she said something like, Brian Albert and Colin Albert um, beat him up, beat John up. And he was, my taillight was cracked. And John was pulverized when she said, we're all like, are you in on the same joke? You know that Brian Albert and Colin Albert beat John up. Um, but she didn't say anything about seeing them smash his head into a taillight. So that was a complete misstatement. Well, Katie says, how can they put that in evidence when Lally lied? Well, it wasn't in front of the jury, Katie. I don't think, I don't think he thought the judge was going to make him play it. I think he just wanted that out to the TV viewing public because we're not on the jury. Hi, Lisa. Go. You know, he said, I, I beg to defer. No, I think what he meant to say is I beg to differ. I know I caught that too. I beg to differ is, is what I think he meant to say. Listen, I misspeak all the time when I'm on the show. I'm talking for three, four hours without a script. I say things all the time. I think that's what he meant to say. I beg to differ. Like, I don't, I don't agree with what you're saying. Uh, so that was my take on that. But I did pick up on that as well. 
<laughs> Jenny says, but they are from Boston. That's why they say, that's why they say worn. Ay, ay, ay. I know. Natalie needs Grammarly. Other, we should all chip in and send them a subscription. <laughs> that would be funny. Yeah. Yep. Jerusha, I got your email. Thank you for that. I'm, uh, for anybody who emailed me about um, mods, I am going through all of them and I will be, uh, you know, anytime I have time because, you know, I know a lot of people don't believe it, but I really do have a life outside of YouTube. I really do. It's a pretty busy one too. Um, but I will get to that. And thank you for that. She didn't say anything even remote to witnessing them do anything. No, she didn't. She said, are you all in on the joke? So I think that's what they're talking about there, that body-worn camera video. Then they have some recorded interviews of Julie Albert, Chris Albert, Courtney Elberg, and Michael Proctor. Okay, when were those interviews recorded? There's no date there. So WTF. Uh, Courtney Elberg is Michael Proctor's sister, if I'm not mistaken. So when were those interviews recorded? Oh, I know. I know what they what must have done. Right after, was it Yan It was Yanetti who said in court about the text messaging between Julie Albert and Michael Proctor's sister, Courtney. She said, I want to get your brother a thank you gift when this is all over. And she texted that to Courtney on the day that Karen was brought into court on February 2nd of 2022. And then Michael Proctor texted his sister back and said, uh, ha tell him just to get my wife one. Tell her just to get my wife a gift. Do you think? Olivia, where are you, Olivia? Olivia. Uh, hang on. Um, so did they, after, uh, Yanetti said that in open court, do you think that that's when they went and took those recorded video, uh, recorded interviews? Cause they, it, okay. That was the first recorded video that they ever did in the history of this case was of Lucky Loughran, the snowplow driver who plowed Fairview on the night in question. However, the defense had to find Lucky on their own because the defense was told that there was a different plow company who plowed the road that night. And that was a mistruth, an untruth, a lie. So they tracked down Lucky Loughran on their own. And Lucky Loughran told the defense that he plowed in front of Fairview at around 2.30 a.m. And there was no body there. And the reason he knows that there was no body there is because he'd been plowing that street for a very long time, he knows that there is a fire hydrant there that he needs to watch for. And therefore, his headlights are right there. So, that's interesting. All right, that's what I think. So, Lucky was the first interview that they recorded. It was 18 months after the date in question and something like seven pages of that interview was about Turtle Boy and not the night that John O'Keefe was killed, Officer John O'Keefe was killed. So again, I say WTF. That's what I'm going to say instead of instead of the cursing words, cursy words. Um, all of a sudden now they decide they want to record some interviews um, because they were doing group interviews of their friends when this whole thing started. So, huh. Okay. Uh, this is also interesting to me. Um, oh, is Peter Murphy in the house? Peter Murphy, I owe you a phone call. I owe you a phone call. I meant to do it three different times today. And I just, I, my, I, everything got away from me. Um, copy of Massachusetts state police investigative services division reports. Something happened on April 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 2024, and all associated interview notes and attachments. What is that about? Is that another, is that another Turtle Boy thing? The friendly herd around the world, says Kimberly Jean RN. I love your accents too. And when I try and imitate it, I'm just jealous. It's not that I'm I'm making fun. 
Why aren't they allowing it known that it's his sister? Interesting. And you'll see when she's named on the witness list of the defense, they call her Courtney Proctor. But you may recall, if you've been following this case forever, Colin Albert was the ring bearer in Courtney's wedding. And that's where all those wedding photos from came from. That they were all sitting at the same table at Courtney's wedding. Something like, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And the judge was like, well, it was 15 years ago. Well, doesn't that go to the point that they have been friends for even longer? I mean, what? Yeah, I don't know what that police report is about, though. Massachusetts State Police Investigative Services Division reports. Are those the internal affairs reports? I don't know. April 1, 2, and 3. Please remember to hit the like. There were no notes or recordings, BL, of anything else but this. This is the first. It, and it doesn't say what the date is when they did these interviews. So they have to be recent. Wicked Pissa. Yeah, that should actually be on the bingo cord, uh, the bingo card, Dina. Oh. I want my vengeance says, FYI, I just read one of Larry's tweets this AM. She quoted John Adams again this AM. Is the same quote, or did she pick a different one? Stifler's mom says, Jackson and Yanetti's hands may be bound, but they are not tied. Remember that. Did somebody said it's other body cam? Olivia, you can just uh, send me a message by the uh, the old-fashioned way instead of trying to drop it in this chat because uh, I, I can't even buy the yard, right? They said buy the yard was the, to uh, the plow company that plowed the street. That was a lie. And also they said all well, the GPS, um, you know, the GPS monitors, gizmos, whatever, that were on the plow, the plows that night were all broken. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, in addition to all the other missing, missing video, Debbie says, Lucky's the best guy. Uh, uh, you think Rob says the feds found Lucky first, did they? Before the defense? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Well, in other words, let's just keep going. So we don't know what that is. Um, copy of the demonstration video prepared by Ian Whiffen, a copy of PowerPoint presentation presented by Ian Whiffen. And that's, we talked about that. Or uh, Lally explained that the other, <laughs> Lally, Lally, Lally explained that the other day in court. All this Ian Whiffen crap is the police state's pathetic attempt to rebuke Haas long to die in cold at 2.27 a.m. by Jen McCabe. Except for that, are they going to just call him in to say, listen, I didn't screw up this report. I didn't lie to the court. I didn't intentionally try and mislead anyone. But, you know, the software um, to figure out the um, exact timestamp on that search had not yet been invented. And so, therefore, that's why my results are wrong. Because that might be a lie, too. Hi, Patricia. Is the judge calling him Officer O'Keefe? No, she didn't even call him Officer, Patricia. I think she said Mr. O'Keefe. I do not think she said O'Keefe. I hope I hope not. If if she did, I missed that, but I don't think so. Copy of UC Davis Veterinary Genetics Laboratory, complete file. That's where they sent Officer O'Keefe's clothing to be tested for canine DNA. And a copy of curriculum, the, the curriculum vitae or CV of Terry Cun, C U N. She's the um <clears throat> I guess forensic pathologist who works at this UC Davis veterinary genetics laboratory. When I tried to do a little uh, dive into that, that facility, I could only find some older articles on them. And at the time that these articles were written, they, they worked out of a trailer outside UC Davis and they only had three employees. And I think they're one of the only labs in the country that tests for canine DNA. But my question is, and I don't think that the defense needs 
a forensic expert in canine DNA because the chain of custody on the clothing is so bungled that by the time that they tested it, for those of you who don't know, Officer O'Keefe's clothing was piled on the floor next to him while he was laying on a gurney in the um, Good Samaritan Medical Center. We, there's photos of it. And then Trooper Proctor, the MSP investigator who's the lead on this case, took the, the clothing, put it somewhere, maybe the backseat of his patrol car, in his trunk, in a bag, in the washing machine, uh, and did not log it into evidence in something in, until something like four to six months later. And no, I'm sorry, four to six weeks later. So, you know, where did that clothing go? It certainly wasn't bagged as evidence. Um, so I think there's enough cross-examination there. And again, if they did, if they did send it to this, did, did anybody know if John O'Keefe had a dog or a cat or any kind of an animal? Anybody know? Because there, there absolutely would have been some other dog hair on his clothing if he lived with a dog. I mean, you can't leave your house without having a dog hair on you. So, I mean, allegedly they were looking for canine DNA because they did not swab Officer O'Keefe's arm. They did not swab his arm tissue. On the right forearm, uh, gashes or lacerations, which clearly look like a dog attack or an animal attack of some kind. They didn't swab that tissue. They just took the clothing that was piled up on the floor and then in someone's officer, Trooper Proctor's backseat of his car in his trunk for four to six weeks before it made it to evidence. And they just took the shirt and sent it to this lab, something like. I don't know, last month, right? So I'd be curious to find if they, I'd be curious to know if they found any other, anything else on the, on any other animal hair or anything. Love Adam Lally. Um, on the uh, clothing. Anybody know? Yeah, Jennifer says, of course not, because Proctor told her not to. Wasn't there a whole period of time, too, where he was not responding to their emails? And so, uh, or is that, that was on the other DNA? Can't keep it straight. Yeah. Hello, Team Brittany. Thank you for all of your help in being such an amazing moderator. And who knows what was done with the clothing before they turned it over? That's what I'm saying. And where is this hoodie? That's what I'm saying. I don't know if the hoodie is on the evidence list. Yeah, I know. Four, one, four, two, and four, three. It says April one, two, and three, but it has a 2024 date, Olivia. That's why I was so confused. Hmm. So who knows what the condition of these, the clothes were by the time they turned it over. And that is that document. The next document that we're going to look at is uh, the, I think that's the one we just did look at. Oh, except I need to change it on my screen. So hold on. Actually, before we go to that, I think that right now is a good time to take a break and hear a word from our sponsor. And for those of you who are not aware, if you are or ever have been an AT&T wireless customer, you may remember about a month ago, maybe two months ago, when AT&T service went out like worldwide and everyone lost service and everybody was mad because they couldn't do business or use their phone. And AT&T said, hey, don't worry, we're just doing a software update. No big whoop. We're going to give you a $5 credit for your inconvenience. Well, they announced about two weeks ago that actually there was a huge data breach and 74 million customers' social security numbers were leaked to the dark web. Not just your social security numbers and not just current customers. So anybody who is a customer uh, after 2019, there was about 7 million of you. And anybody before 2019, there was about 64 million of you. So it seems like my sponsor could have not come at a better time. And actually, they have been my sponsor since before this data breach. But I thought I'd bring it to your attention just in case you're affected by that because my sponsor, Aura, can help you in case anything happens. Take a listen. Did you know that the odds of falling victim to online crime are one in four? Online crime is soaring. It's time to get smart about online safety. 
That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura provides everything you need to protect your privacy, identity, finances, and your family in one easy to use app. Do you even realize how much of your personal information is already out there being sold by data brokers to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may wanna target you? Well, if you Google yourself, you may find something like this. And it may shock you to know that your full name, home address, email address, health records, and even relatives, it's all out there. That's one of the reasons you need Aura. Aura shows you which data brokers are selling your information and automatically submits opt-out requests on your behalf. Not only does cleaning up this information reduce the amount of spam that you get, but it will protect you from hackers who could use the information to help them access your social media accounts, bank accounts, and other sensitive information. Aura also helps protect me and my family from online threats by providing antivirus and malware protection, a secure VPN with military grade encryption, credit monitoring, spam call protection, parental controls, password management, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It's really easy to set up. And best of all, I get everything at one affordable price. With the family plan, Aura will help you protect your kids by blocking harmful content, managing how much time they can spend online, and providing you with peace of mind while they game with cyberbullying and online predator threat alerts. I value my privacy and my online safety, and I value yours too. So go to aura.com slash Melanie Little to start your two week free trial because you can't put a price on peace of mind. I've also put the link in the video description below. You can thank me later. You can thank me later. Uh, listen, for starting at just 12 bucks a month, you get the VPN and you get the antivirus that would cost you um, more than that just to get those things alone. I know because I have and uh, I actually am a customer. So it is a great um, sponsor for this channel because I do believe that you should all try and be safe online and keep your kids safe too. All right. So the next document we are going to take a look at is remember when they were arguing the motions in lemonade, as they were calling them in the closed captionings, uh, the motion in motions in lemonade, we have now come to call them about whether or not the defense should be allowed to introduce evidence regarding the internal affairs of investigation of Trooper Michael Proctor. Because if you're just joining, you may not know that the FBI is currently still investigating the investigation of Karen Reed's case. So the feds have stepped in. There's a parallel investigation going on. And because of that, Trooper Michael Proctor is under an internal affairs investigation with the Massachusetts State Police. So during one of these motions in Lemonade, the defense uh, has asked the judge to admit evidence. They want to use the fact that Trooper Michael Proctor has an internal investigation, uh, internal investigation, internal, internal affairs investigation pending. And also that Sergeant Lank who was the first, who was not the first officer to arrive on scene at 34 Fairview, but he was the first friendly to arrive on scene because he's childhood friends with the Alberts. The Alberts, Brian Albert's house is where it happened. And there are six boys in the Albert family. So he's got five brothers. They've been childhood friends and he has a history of inserting himself in investigations regarding the Alberts going back to at least 2002. And we know that because there was a lawsuit about it. And he was sued. Canton paid a big settlement to um, the two brothers that he beat the pulp, beat one of them to a pulp and actually bit him. And like I said, this this, this case is crazy, my, my friends. You, you just can't make this up. So let's just take a look at the documents because maybe the documents can explain it better than I can. I try, but uh, I get so far in the weeds on this sometimes that, I mean, if you know, you know. So when they tried to argue this the other day at the pretrial co conference, judge said to the defense, yeah, I need you to put, put, put some stuff in writing for me. Give me a brief with some case law so that I can, you know, take this under advisement. Put that on your bingo card. Take this under advisement because that happens a lot. 
in addition to O'Lally saying, I'll be brief and then talk for 20 more minutes. Okay. <laughs> does John O'Keefe's shirt have bite marks? Uh, yeah, I believe it does. But now that we know that Sergeant Lank has been uh, biting people since at least 2002, I have questions about where the bite mark came from. Although if you haven't seen it, I did do a great show with a, with a, a canine dog trainer who had never even heard about this case. And I showed him the picture of uh, Officer O'Keefe's arm and he's like, 100% dog attack. I'm like, really? How do you know? And he came on the show and he talked to me about, for about two hours. And uh, it was a really great show. His name's Garrett Wing. He has a YouTube channel with about, I don't know, well over a million followers. He might be up to 2 million. And he teaches a lot of, he has a lot of videos on his channel about how to train your own dog too. So he's, he's very interesting. Great guy. Great guy. Okay. Um, so here's the supplemental memorandum in support of defendants' opposition to the Commonwealth's motion in limine. Oh, so here, okay. So I misspoke. I'm sorry. The Commonwealth made the motion to exclude any evidence that Trooper Proctor is under internal affairs investigation and to exclude any, quote, bad character evidence about Sergeant Lank. And so the judge asked the defense to supplement in writing. And here's their supplement. And they explain it as follows. Here, the Commonwealth has moved to prohibit the defense from referencing, one, an internal affairs investigation, which was initial, initiated against Trooper Proctor in connection with this case, and two, evidence establishing that Sergeant Lank has used his position as a law enforcement officer in the past to protect the Albert family. As set forth below, Ms. Reed has a constitutional right to pre present the evidence in question because it bears directly on the credibility of the two material witnesses who will be called by the Commonwealth at trial in this matter to testify against Ms. Reed. A defendant has a constitutional right to confrontation and cross-examination of witnesses as guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and Article 12 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights. Indeed, the Supreme Judicial Court has long held that the reason that reasonable cross-examination in order to reveal bias or prejudice of a witness is a matter of right. As the Supreme Judicial Court has made clear, quote, a defendant has the constitutional right to bring to a jury's attention any circumstance which may be material which may materially affect the testimony of an adverse witness, which might lead the jury to find that the witness is under an influence to prevaricate. Prevaricate. This will be our word of the day. Prevaricate means to, to be evasive or misleading. Prevaricate. Try and work that into your everyday conversation. It matters not that the evidence would reveal an otherwise inadmissible fact, such as the witness's commission of a crime, a judge may not restrict cross-examination of a material witness by foreclosing inquiry into a subject that could show bias or prejudice on the part of the witness. Sergeant Lank is a material witness in this case who the defense anticipates will be called by the Commonwealth to testify regarding his observations as a first responding officer on the morning of January 29th, 2022. Notably, Sergeant Lank was the first person to enter Brian Albert's residence at 34 Fairview Road on the morning of January 29th of 2022. I'm going to break from the document. Well, maybe they'll, they'll say it, so I won't have to. I'll, I'll break now, just in case they don't say it. Um, the house was never searched. The house was never searched. Sergeant Lank went into the house to interview witnesses who were also his lifelong friends, Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, Jennifer McCabe, and Matt McCabe. I don't know if he was like lifelong friends with all of them, but he's definitely a childhood friend of Brian Albert's. Back to the document. Testimony and evidence presented at trial will establish the following. 
In 2002, after drinking at an establishment in Canton, Chris Albert, a witness in this case, and his brother, Tim Albert, walked out to a parking lot and got into an argument with a man named Mark. I think I was pronouncing his name wrong, so I'm going to try and get it right this time. Lopalato. I'm going to say Lopalato. We've been saying Lopalito, but now that I look at the spelling, looks like Lopalato. And proceeded to physically attack and beat him. After the beating, Mark called his brother, Alfredo Lopalato. Alfredo went to the parking lot where the fight took place to check on his brother. Officer Lank was an off-duty Canton police officer and had been drinking in the bar with Chris Albert and Kevin Albert on the night in question. After hearing the commotion outside, Officer Lank stumbled out of the bar, yelling that he was a police officer and that he was, quote, deputizing himself, end quote. Officer Lank is one of Chris Albert's best friends from high school and has known the Albert family most of his life. When Canton patrol officers arrived on scene, Lank instructed them to cuff Alfredo. With Alfredo incapacitated, Lank proceeded to attack Mark. He pushed him, punched him, took him to the ground, continued to beat him on the ground, then bit him hard enough to cut through his skin. Patrol officers had to pull Lank off of Mark. Lank then walked over and spit in Alfredo's face. On August 31st of 2002, Mark went to the Canton Police Department to file a, former compl a formal complaint against Sergeant Lank. He was told to come back on September 3rd of 2002 if he wanted to file a complaint. On September 3rd of 2002, he returned to the Canton Police Department to file the complaint. On September 4th of 2000, on September 24th of 2002, he and his brother Alfredo were criminally charged with assaulting a police officer. However, all of the reports about this supposed assault were written on September 2nd of 2002 after Mark had attempted to file a complaint against Officer Lank. It, we went into much more detail on this uh, incident that gave rise to this lawsuit on, I think, the last stream that we did because there was a motion about it. But in any event, this is an abbreviated version. Not like it's not bad enough, but um, yeah. Officer Lank subsequently ran into Mark and Alfredo at a gas station in town. Lank called patrol officers and had them both rearrested for witness intimidation. Deja vu all over again. Both Mark and Alfredo were ultimately found not guilty of all criminal charges regarding the alleged assault on a police officer. The DA's office thereafter filed a null prosecue, which is a not, uh, we decided, we're deciding not to prosecute. That's your Latin for the day. Uh, in the witness intimidation case. Here, Sergeant Lang's prior willingness to deputize himself in order to help his longtime friend, Chris Albert, a witness in this case, bears directly on Sergeant Lang's bias and prejudice in this case against Ms. Reed and in favor of the Alberts. All of these events illustrate the extent of Sergeant Lang's relationship with and protection of the Albert family. Admission of this information is absolutely necessary to establish the nature and extent of Sergeant Lang's relationship with the homeowner and his family in this case. Ms. Reed has a constitutional right to bring to the jury's attention the nature and extent of Sergeant Lang's relationship with the Alberts precisely because it illustrates his bias against Ms. Reed, regardless of whether it could be otherwise characterized as inadmissible evidence of misconduct. The Commonwealth also seeks to exclude evidence that the Massachusetts State Police have initiated an internal in affairs investigation into Trooper Proctor's conduct in connection with this case. The fact that Trooper Proctor is facing potential professional disciplinary action precisely because of his conduct in this case, means that he has a personal interest in the outcome of these proceedings and necessarily also has a bias and prejudice against Ms. Reed. As explained by the Supreme Judicial Court in Aguilar, or Aguiar, the judge cannot restrict cross-examination of a material witness by foreclosing inquiry into a subject that could show bias or prejudice on the part of that witness. Ms. Reed has a constitutional right to present this evidence because it suggests that Trooper Proctor has a reason to prevaricate, there's our word again, meaning be evasive or misleading. Trooper Proctor has a reason to prevaricate in order to avoid adverse findings by internal affairs. In conclusion, Ms. Reed respectfully requests that this court deny the Commonwealth's motion in limine number 28 and or defer ruling on this issue until such time as these witnesses testify in connection with this case. XOXO. 
smooth as butter, Alan Jackson and team. Let's go to the chat for a minute. If I can get my cursor to come over here, we can do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. See how you guys are doing over here. Thank you, Stephanie, for becoming a new member. Della, thank you again for coming in here with the another 10 spot. I'm writing Mariska Hargitay, executive producer of Law & Order SVU. Oh, I know Mariska Hargitay. In fact, I was watching the episode last night from last week that I taped about you regarding DA on the show. I'm from Hollywoodland. I'll make all points. TV needs realistic peeps, input, and glam look, and you have it all. You know what? First of all, I love that show so much. I've auditioned for it several times. I'm still sitting in this chair. <laughs> or actually I started sitting in this chair. Um, but you know what? Uh, Tony Goldwyn. Did anybody ever watch Scandal? That was an amazing Shonda Rhimes show years ago with Kerry Washington and Tony Goldwyn was the president. He has just taken over on the original Law & Order reboot as the DA, replacing Jack McCoy, played by Sam Waterston. So, uh, Della, if you've got the Hollywood Land connections, um, Law and Order proper would be great too. I mean, or organized crime with Elliot Stabler because Chris Maloney is my jam. But um, you know, I digress. But yeah, Della, I'm all in. Thank you. I've auditioned for all those shows, but uh, there was a strike for a long time. Finally, finally, we're back to business. I just got two auditions today, so uh, you know, don't keep me here too long. Um, just kidding. Just kidding. I love being here with you guys. Katie, thank you for the 10. Are we sure Judge Canoni passed the bar? I mean, you know, allegedly she did. Oh, and that's the other thing. Her brother is a lawyer. And he represented Chris Albert in a fatal motor, fatal motor vehicle accident all the way back in 1997. These ties run so deep. The family roots of Canton are pretty freaking twisted. And that was Chris Albert, correct? Represented him in a hit and run motor vehicle accident in which he killed, I think, a 26 year old student, fled the scene. He surrendered, I think, the next day, spent six months in jail, never tested for DUI. Chris, he did do six, six months, right? People say I thought it was her dad, but no, I believe it was her brother. 1994, 1997, 1994. Her brother could have been an attorney for sure in 1994. So I don't know why that wasn't brought up in the in the motion to recuse, but I did do an entire show on the motion to recuse. We went through that at length. Hi, BR. Thanks for your, uh, your super chat. Does the defense have to provide an exhibit list? Yeah, we're going to go through that next. And I don't think that they have yet, but yeah, they will have to. So that's why I was kind of confused because it was, it only seemed to have the prosecution exhibits on it. So yeah, I don't have a copy of it yet though. If anybody does have a copy of it, the defense exhibit list, unless this is a joint exhibit list, which I don't think I'm just watching the chat on my phone here to see if anybody knows. Hmm. <laughs> Liz says, love this platform, plus it's classy and I can play with the little grandsons around. Thank you. I know a lot of people say that. Some people say, uh, this is the only place I can watch. My my mom, who's 95, can watch true crime coverage. And then somebody else said to me, she, I think she's, I think Laura, I don't know, Laura, if you're here tonight, but she said, it was so funny. She said, I had my uh, laptop on and I went in the other room and my seven-year-old daughter said, mom, your friend Melanie's coming on TV. And it was funny because people say they can listen to me without their earbuds because they don't curse. I thought it was so funny. Uh, Cheryl, thanks for the 20. Very kind. Do you think anyone from Karen's defense team follows your channel to pick up on your views or false information, especially the judge's statements? Uh, I don't know. I, you know, I know that when... Um, I'm going to put the Venmo up here in case anybody feels like it because YouTube takes 30% of Super Chats. So, um, you know, Venmo is cool too, Cash App, whatever you want to do. And I, I look, I'm not going to beg you for money like certain people do, but look, and I, I have two kids going to college next year, so all donations are happily accepted. Um, I do know that when we watched the Maya Kowalski trial together, uh, many of you did watch that with me. We covered that at length and I don't cover a lot of cases, but when I cover them, 
I cover them deeply. And Maya Kowalski's case was one of them. That was a civil trial out of Florida. It was Maya Kowalski and against Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And the defense firm, in that case, they were defending the hospital, pulled their legal arguments directly off a of Reddit thread, like directly off a of Reddit thread. It was crazy. So I know that they monitor, I'm sure both sides are monitoring chats because you guys are the mirror jury. Did anybody ever used to watch the TV show Bull with Michael Weatherly? He had, it was a TV show about a company that Bull owned and he was a jury consultant and that's what they did. They would hire uh, mirror jurors to come in and listen to the case and get their opinion on the case. So you guys, what you're typing in the chat they're watching and they're looking at the comments to see what people out there are thinking, the general public, because you guys are the jury pool and you guys are smart. So I don't know if they know about that. I mean, I don't know that they follow me specifically, but I'm saying jurors from a bus stop. That's right. Jerusha, jurors from a bus stop. That's what they said. There was a um, an email that was leaked by one of the defense attorneys and he said something like, those bus stop jurors are all over. Like, who's dissing? Like, juries, people loved Bull. I loved Bull, too. I, I did love Michael Weatherly, although some of the things that I heard that he did after that show or during the course of that show, or I didn't like the stuff that he did. Any news news about how jury selection went? Yeah. Um, if, hi, Johan, Johan. Johan, if you were not here in the beginning, he, they have seated 11 jurors so far by the end of today. So what they need to do is tomorrow is to get five more because there needs to be a jury of 12 plus four alternates. This is going to be between a four and seven week trial. And the ultimate alternates are very necessary in case anybody has to leave, anybody gets sick, anybody has a family emergency. Um, Diane loved Bull and Boston Legal. Yeah, it's good. Boston Legal is pretty funny. You know what my kids are into now, which is so funny? is Suits. All of a sudden they're watching Suits. And it's so funny because it's it's a, an older show, but it's all of a sudden getting this huge resurgence on whatever it's on, Amazon Prime or Netflix or whatever. And the uh, the stars of that show are like, like doing commercials like, wow, people are finally watching our show. <laughs> Why did they cancel us? <laughs> Crazy. Uh, Meghan Markle got her start on that show before she married a prince. So, uh, you know, there's that. All right, let's see, um, moving on to the next document that we want to look at, which is going to be the witness list and the pretrial mem memorandum. And this is what the judge was supposed to read to the jury, which is the statement of facts. Oops. That was agreed to by both sides. Statement of facts. On the morning of January 29th, 2022, at approximately 6.04 a.m., the Canton Police Department received a 911 call reporting an unresponsive male party in the snow outside a residence at 34 Fairview Road within their town. Officers responded and discovered the male party, subsequently identified as John O'Keefe, off the roadway in the front lawn area. Officers identified three women with Mr. O'Keefe, one of whom was the defendant, Karen Reed, the girlfriend of Mr. O'Keefe. Again, Mr. O'Keefe, they can't call him officer. I'm reading it word for word. I'm not going to embellish. The defendant had been with Mr. O'Keefe the previous evening at two different bars in Canton and had driven with him to this residence in the early morning hours of this date. It was supposed to say this residence. She said his residence, right? I'm not crazy, right? It says this residence. In the early morning hours of this date, Mr. O'Keefe was treated by paramedics from the Canton Fire Department and transported to the Good Samaritan Medical Center, where he was subsequently pronounced deceased. The Commonwealth alleges that the defendant struck Mr. O'Keefe with her vehicle earlier that morning and then left the scene while Mr. O'Keefe lay injured in the snow during a blizzard. It was not a blizzard. The defendant denies that she has committed any crimes. So many of you, I'm breaking for a second. So many of you sent me your own ring doorbell video footage 
from your own homes in Canton at 6.04 a.m. on January 29th of 2022, showing that there was a light dusting of snow, maybe two inches. Stipulations, none. That means that they've agreed on nothing. We've agreed on nothing, Your Honor. You need to rule on all this stuff. Proposed exhibits. So I would imagine that these are the proposed exhibits of the Commonwealth. And the judge has ruled that she will go, I think, on a case by case basis. And as they are, you know, as they want to introduce them, they are going to have to lay a foundation. They are going to have to call a witness to authenticate the document because you have to lay a foundation before you you enter something into evidence. You can't just say, um, I just, I want to enter this into evidence. Let me just see if I can find a better. There has to be proper foundation laid. Sometimes they need to call in uh, a witness, a uh, record keeper, let's say, from the hospital to say, yes, this is a true and correct certified copy of the hospital record. They'd have to call the medical examiner in to say, yes, this is a true copy of the death certificate. You can't just be willy-nilly admitting documents into evidence. That's not the way it works. A proper foundation must be laid. Certified copy of death certificate of John O'Keefe. Uh, again, not officer, but um, we do know, for those of you just tuning, tuning in, that the manner of death listed on the death certificate is undetermined. There are five choices for manner of death that can be less listed on a death certificate, and they are homicide, suicide, accidental, natural, or undetermined. The medical examiner in this case did not say that this was a homicide. In fact, the autopsy report, nowhere does it say that Officer John O'Keefe's injuries are consistent with a motor vehicle accident. In fact, the cause of the manner of death is listed as undetermined. The cause of death is listed as blunt force trauma to the head and hypothermia. So for those of you who are new to this case, I'm going to point out to you that I'm not going to show the autopsy photos, but I am going to tell you that as a result of what the Commonwealth is claiming is a low-speed motor vehicle accident, Lexus SUV versus pedestrian. The injuries that were sustained are multiple skull fractures, something like a three-inch gash to the back of the head. We've seen photos of it. It would bleed like crazy. Multiple lacerations to the right forearm that look to me to be from a dog attack and not from a, any Alexis doesn't bite as far as I can tell. And there would be nothing sharp on an Alexis that would cause these injuries to his arm. If you haven't seen them, you will see them soon. Boxer fractures to both hands. And in the autopsy photos, you can see them, see the, the, the measurements of the bruises on both hands. Two black eyes, and it looks to me like a fractured nose. We don't know about that yet because we don't know all the details. But there are no injuries to the torso, to the legs, to the knees. Injuries that you would expect to see when someone is hit by a car. And that's why I've been so adamant about the fact that I do not think that he was hit by a car. Okay? I have litigated in addition to suing the Catholic Church and representing 50, 60, 70 survivors and victims of clergy sex abuse on Long Island against the Catholic Church, I also litigated hundreds of motor vehicle accident cases, if not thousands. And I can tell you that if you were hit by a car at a low speed, you would sustain injuries to your legs, your hips, your lower body. Just like when Police Chief Helena Rafferty of Canton hit a pedestrian in a crosswalk in February with her police vehicle. And that poor man has had nine surgeries to his lower body and multiple fractures. So, um, uh, you know, she also didn't report that back to the town of Canton. So, so much for transparency in Canton. Where's my Cantonberry Tales? That's my one of my other favorite screen names, Cantonberry Tales. Yeah, a car in reverse, right? I don't know. They keep changing their theory. At one point, they said she was going in reverse at like 24 miles an hour. And she did a 
a K turn, what you guys are calling a K turn, what I would call a three point turn. He fought the car. The car won. Um, Hi, Sunflower Day. I went back to hear the judge say his, not this. Yeah, in my opinion, we, we rewound it too. It's only when I read that document to you that I realized it should have been this, but it was definitely his. I agree. All right. Then they want to put in there the copy of the Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab Serum Plasma, Plasma Conversion Report and the Retrograde Extrapolation Report, both of which we know that the defense is trying to keep out based upon the way that Karen and the way and the method in which Karen's blood was drawn from the Good Samaritan Medical Center. So if you guys don't know that are watching, after Officer O'Keefe's body was taken to the hospital to be warmed up before he could be pronounced dead. So his the 911 call came in at 6.04 a.m., EMTs respond to the scene, fire department, I think, responds to the scene, several police cars. He is not pronounced dead. I, I remember you guys, we went over this too, and there were breath sounds, and there's some other signs of life too, but I don't know. I'm, I'm sure we'll hear, we'll hear more about that at the trial. So they bring him to Good Samaritan Medical Center in an ambulance, and they tell Carrie Roberts that she can take Karen back to the house. So they leave. Apparently there's body cam footage of Sergeant Good saying, I'm going to section her at 6.30 a.m. Then they tell us or that someone called Canton PD and said that Karen is suicidal. And so they call Carrie Roberts and tell Carrie Roberts to bring Karen back to the scene where they put her in an ambulance. And they bring her to Good Samaritan Medical Center under, what do you guys call it? A Rule 12? or section 12, um, we would call it a 5150 hold here or a 72 hour hold that you can put someone under an involuntary psych hold if they're a danger to themselves or others. And that's why her blood was drawn. Her blood was not drawn by a state trooper coming in to say, this person's been arrested for DUI. We need to take their blood so we can test their blood alcohol levels. It was taken with a CBC, a section 12. Thanks, Olivia. Section 12. It was taken as an ethanol result pulled from what I would assume is just a, a CBC. That was a blood panel that was drawn on her. And then they're trying to extrapolate it back and calling it. That's how they're trying to prove that she was drunk at the time of the accident. Defense is trying to keep that out. Copy of the 911 calls. Calls. So there was more than one. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I think there was one that went to like Central Station and then they were tra she was transferred to McCabe. That's interesting. That says calls, but copy of the Canton Police Department photos, which we know are photos only of the drinking glass that was found at the scene and the six drops of blood that were put into red Solo cups borrowed from a neighbor. That's right. You can't make this stuff up. I have questions. Peter Murphy, are you, if you're still here, um, we know that they tested the taillight pieces for DNA. Did they ever test the drinking glass pieces for DNA? Did they ever dust the drinking glass pieces for fingerprints? Because I haven't seen any records or any reports about that. And wouldn't you think that they would want to know if John was the last person to hold that glass, if John even did ever hold that glass, if he drank out of that glass, if his fingerprints were on that glass, or if they, as they alleged, they thought that Karen threw the glass at him. So wouldn't they want to prove that her fingerprints were on it and that maybe she threw it at him or something? Or did they not want to test it because someone else's fingerprints might have been on it or DNA? Nope, Scott, Scott doesn't think so. Because that's a great cross-examination right there. Okay, so you ran the DNA on the taillight pieces that you didn't find for 12 hours on top of the snow after 12 inches of snow fell. 
and after you came into possession of Karen Reed's vehicle. So you found DNA on those taillight pieces, something like two years after the incident, but you never even tested the drinking glass for DNA. You never even went in the house to see if they had the same kind of drinking glasses. And you never even went in the house to see if anybody else in the house was injured. I don't know. I have so many questions. And did you test the blood drops? Did, they, did you test the blood drops to see if they came from an unknown assailant? Or did you test the blood drops to find out that they came from Officer Don O'Keefe, in which case, where's the rest of the blood? He lost massive amounts of blood, according to autopsy. So whose blood drops were they? I have questions. And the jury's going to have questions. And there's going to be a lot of cross-examination on that. And like I said, to the New York Post, there's enough reasonable doubt in this case to drive a truck through. <laughs> Olivia's like, nah, because they already knew the answer. They knew everyone was fine inside the house. Yeah, because they got a personal phone call from somebody in there. Please come down, friendly. Maybe. Yeah, Lucky is going to be a witness. Yes, yes, he is going to be a witness. He's on the list. Just hang on a second. We're getting there. Nobody came out of the house who lived there. Nobody came out of the house when Karen was screaming bloody murder. When the ambulance showed up, when a number of cop cars showed up, when they used a, snow, a leaf blower that they borrowed from a neighbor to blow the snow around to find more evidence. The police officer who owned that house and his wife never came out of the house because they say they were sleeping. And Lally said, well, nobody else came out of their houses either, which can't be true because Can PD says they borrowed a leaf blower from a neighbor and got the solo cups from a neighbor. Yep. Two words, reasonable doubt. Yeah, reasonable doubt. So that's the Canton PD photos. Those are the only photos that they took, as far as I know. Uh, a copy of the Ring video from One Meadows Avenue in Canton, and we talked about that too. There's one video, and then there's some missing video, and we found out, I think yesterday, the day before, I think I took yesterday off, that um, Trooper Proctor had possession of John O'Keefe's phone after his body was taken away, and he accessed the Ring app from Officer O'Keefe's phone. He he admits it. So for all those who thought I was lying when I said that another time, it's in the papers. All you got to do is read the papers. Read the papers and you can find out too. It's not a secret. I'm not making stuff up. I'm not lying. It's all in the papers. Bring me the papers. What was that from? Bring me the papers. Got to sign the papers. That is right, Fairy Raven. They used the neighbor's leaf blower. Let they, they said nobody came on the street outside. That is true. Madam Roz, question Globe reporter Gretchen Voss is a witness, yet she showed up in the reporter's pool on, on, on TW, and that was an issue in court today. Our witnesses notified they're not allowed to come to court. She's not a newbie. She know, they're not allowed to come to court. You are not allowed to sit in court until your testimony is over, sometimes not even at all. Because you, you you don't they don't want you influenced by what other people are testifying to. She should have known that. Is that why uh, Yanetti went to the? Is that what um, Ted Daniel was tweeting about when he said I have something very important to talk about? And then they went to sidebar. Is that when she when Gretchen Voss left? I have questions. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, who needs mobile CSI units? There's always a neighbor supplies and equipment. Yeah, you never know. Maybe you got a power washer they could have used too. All right, moving on. Copy of video surveillance from Waterfall Bar and Grill, where they look very lovey-dovey. And uh, you can see his belt in that video. And uh, his belt is gone. So there's that. Um, copy of receipt from Waterfall Bar and Grill. Good, I've been wanting to see that receipt. Copy of surveillance video from CF McCarthy's. Copy of receipts from CF McCarthy's. Copy of Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab CSS 
photos, crime scene, something, something photos. Copy of MSP scene photos, search, search. That's when they found the taillight pieces 12 hours later. Copy of surveillance video from Canton Town Library. If you know, you know, there's two minutes missing from that video. Uh, what would likely be the exact time Karen Reed's car would have driven past the Canton Town Library on her way back to One Meadows, which may have shown that her taillight was still intact at that time. Copy of the MSP vehicle diagram, copy of MSP cert unit diagram, copy of OCME autopsy photos, copy of Celebrite extraction report of the cell phones of Jennifer McCabe, Carrie Roberts, John O'Keefe, Karen Reed, and Jennifer McCabe from January 28 to 29 of 2022, which will show she made that search at 2.27 a.m. And then again, at something like 6.30, don't hold me to the times, 6.33 and 6.34, 6.27 and 6.29, something like that. Spelling it wrong each time and then the third and final time trying to spell it the same as the first time. Hoss long to die in cold. Copy of the Celebrite extraction of cell phone and Carrie Roberts from January 28 to 29. Copy of Celebrite Extraction Report of Cell Phone of John O'Keefe, phone calls to and from Karen Reed from January 29th, 2022. Copy of Celebrite Extraction Report of Cell Phones of John O'Keefe, voicemails from Karen Reed on January 29th of 2022, where she says, John, I effing hate you. John, you're using me. John, uh, you know, pretty nasty stuff, which we've talked about before too. Like, you know, he didn't come home. He wasn't answering her calls. And he was at an after party with two women who had been texting him all night. She was pissed. She was outraged. Doesn't mean that she intentionally killed him. In fact, if she intentionally killed him, why would she still be texting him and leaving him nasty voicemails? Copy of the MSP cars section vehicle testing video. That's when they tested her Lexus. Copy of RMV documents for the license plate number. I guess that's the registry of motor vehicle documents. And they're going to show that it's her car by showing that it's registered to her, perhaps. Copy of MSP cars sections diagram. Copy of the body and head diagrams of the medical examiner. Copy of... MSP cars section Bosch CDR download. I guess that is the black box information from the Lexus. Clothing, including hat and sneakers of John O'Keefe. Okay, well, why don't we name all the pieces of clothing? Because remember, one sneaker wasn't found until quite some time later in the driveway. Neither was the hat. Took a long time to find that hat as well. Copy of cell phone extraction of communications of Brian Higgins, which are very interesting. If you know, you know. Copy of Verizon cell phone records of Karen Reed. Copy of Verizon VOLTE records of cell sites diagram for Karen Reed's phone. That's, I guess, her location. They're trying to pin down her location. Copy of Verizon RTT records diagram for Karen Reed's phone. Certified copy of medical records of John O'Keefe from Good Samaritan Medical Center. Certified copy of medical records of Karen Reed from Good Sam. Copy of Canton PD cruiser camera videos. That's going to be interesting because they're the only people that had videos on their dash cams when they pulled up to the scene. Copy of the MSP body worn camera footage from June 9th of 2022. That's the video that we watched that they played in court the other day where they misstated what she said. And she said, we're all in, you're, you're all in on the same joke. John was beaten up by Brian Albert and Colin Albert, which only indicates to me that she had been asserting that all along. That was before or the same day that she was upgraded to murder charges. It wasn't after Alan Jackson got involved in this case, like a lot of people were saying. Copy of Canton PD scene search video. Copy of diagram of John O'Keefe's GPS points. Copy of Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab photos of lab work. 
Copy of MSP Cars Section Toyota Tech Stream ACM and VCH data. Copy of Canton Police Department Surveillance Video. Copy a video from residence in Dighton. That's her parents' house, where the car was from where the car was seized. Taillight pieces recovered from scene during five undocumented searches, including one by the Canton police chief, Ken Berkowitz, who was on medical leave and just happened to be driving down there something like a week later and found another giant piece of taillight. Cocktail glass recovered from scene. Oh, so they have taillight pieces from the defendant's vehicle and then taillight pieces recovered from the scene. Cocktail glass recovered from the scene. Oh, because they said there were, didn't they say there were pieces of taillight that were like on the bumper or something after it was towed, after it was driven all the way to Dighton and then towed back from Dighton. So that's like 80 miles round trip in a blizzard. Right. Okay. Got it. Um, and the victim's cell phone. Length of trial, five to six weeks. And that is just uh, the Commonwealth's uh, version. And before we go into the witness list, let's just take a break, take a breath, and go to the chat. Sassy Pants, thank you so much for the super chat. Is Chief Ratchety even on the witness list? I didn't see her name, just Buddy Berkey. Uh, just her Buddy Berkey. We're going to look at it now, so uh, keep that in mind. I don't think so. We're talking about Helena Rafferty, who is the Chief of Police right now of Canton. Thank you, Lance, for becoming a member. And Suzanne, thank you for your super chat. GPS points, but no, not his Apple data watch. Wait. GPS points, but not his Apple data, which is more accurate. The taillight fairy struck Canton. Becky retired. Oh, Berkey. Berkey retired effective February 1 of 2022. So he's retired. He's retired. Rob Geary says, Before that, I just want to say thank you, Casey, for the coffee. <laughs> Casey bought me a coffee. It's matcha latte. I like matcha latte. And Katie for the coffee. Casey says thank you all that you do for all you do. Katie from I think yesterday. Everything you cover is done with grace, but you are not a cupcake, and I love it. <laughs> and Katie again sent another whole bunch of coffees. Katie, you're a very great supporter. As is Janelle. Thank you, Janelle. You're always sending coffees too. Paige, Mamu, Clinton, Jen, and Katie again. You guys are awesome and so supportive. Rob says, it's just amazing to me how the state can pretend to have a case against this woman. Lally knows she didn't do this, yet they persist. Like, bro, what are you doing? Help these people. Did B.A. threaten everyone? Um, you know, I have said that... The video statement that Morrissey gave uh, where he pre-recorded it in front of a bunch of old time law books and half of them were upside down and they were all out of order. He recorded it in his conference room or something and then he just put it out there either on his website or on the, um, on the interwebs or something. He didn't need to take questions. It wasn't a press conference. He like, this has got to stop. It's got to stop. Colin Albert was never in the house. Michael Proctor never went to the scene at 34 Fairview on the day of the... All that stuff that he said. I have called that a hostage video because it looked to me like somebody was holding a gun off camera and forcing him to say that. And if you go back and watch it, and I suggest that you do, we've been over it a couple of times um, on, this, on this channel. Tell me if it doesn't look like a hostage video to you. Like, what is there... I don't know. I, I don't know, but it it's weird. And it's something that a, a district attorney should never, ever do. So improper, beyond improper. Olivia, they are not GPS data points. Olivia is the queen of the documents. You may follow her on Twitter, which they now call X, but I will never call it X. I will always call it Twitter, at Olivia Lambo. And she's got all the documents and all the receipts, and she explains everything in a really easy to understand way and she's fact-based like me and like brandy churchwell but 
those two ladies are way better with the documents that I, I'm way better with the charts, the charts and the documents. And I can barely get my tech to work over here. So um, I appreciate them both so much. They, uh, these are unidentified points that Michael Proctor plotted using a consumer search and rescue app, now defunct, and yardsticks. <laughs> Come on, you can't even make that up. Not a forensic tool like Cellhawk. I mean, that's just, like, that's just funny. This is funny. <laughs> Stacy, thank you for the Venmo. And Lisa, thank you for the Venmo. And Amber for the cash app. You guys are really, 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 really generous. Okay. Oblivious Benson, I see what you sent me. Is that the audio from the, should we play that? You guys want to hear the audio from the um from the man pass out in the snow? Nancy, thank you for the Venmo. Um, the defense has a longer list of evidence than Lally. Oh, I think somebody just emailed it to me. Ooh. <laughs> Melanie may not be a cupcake, but she surely makes me hungry for them. You guys want to hear the um the audio? Yes. Cindy. Hmm. Makes you go, hmm. Scott says, Sergeant Murphy, would it be SOP, standard operating procedure for an MSP boss to respond to the scene also? Great question. Also, it was Lank's day off and it was Proctor's day off, but they both came in for the golden handshake. Thank you, Black Rose, one of my other amazing moderators. Please like and share this video. Lurkers, it's free. <laughs> Yes, and come into the chat. We welcome you. We welcome you. Come on in. Yes. Okay. All right. Oblivious Benson sent it to me. So I know it's authentic because she's my own personal Penelope Garcia. If you get the criminal minds reference, you get the criminal minds met reference. So uh let me just go back to this. I can find it for you. Okay. Um, so let me set this up for you. This is, this is what I think it is. When Karen Reed is in the car with Kerry and Jen McCabe and they pull up to 34 Fairview, Kerry is on the phone trying to reach John and she is leaving him a voicemail and she sees his body and she starts screaming and she drops her phone in the back seat of the car. And wait, hold on. What is this? OB, you sent me a video of me. What is this? I don't know. This isn't what, I don't think this is what you sent me. It wasn't what I thought. I thought this was the video of the car. Hang on one second. Oh, okay. I think you're just making a clip for me. But I think I do have that audio of that phone call. So let me just look somewhere else for it. I was so confused. Um, let's see, 911. Well, I can't find it now, but you know who has it? Turtle Boy has it on his channel. You can find it there. All right. Sorry. Sorry to psych you all up for it. I thought that's what it was. All right. OB, I thought you wanted me to 
to show that. I thought that's what it was. It's a 911 call. Okay, forget it. Forget it, forget it, forget it. Black Rose, I can't slow the chat. Sorry. Oh, that was old. That was old. All right. Um, let's go to the Commonwealth witness list and quickly run through that. And I've even made notes on it for you in case you want to come back to this later. So here's who they intend to call. These are the police officers. We pretty much know who all these guys are. Trooper Michael. So these are MSP, Massachusetts State Police. Trooper Michael Proctor, Yuri Bukinick, Zachary Clark, Connor Keefe, David DiCicco, Christopher Moore, Matthew Dunn, Lieutenant Brian Tully, Nicholas Garino, Joseph Paul, Canton PD, Officer Saraf, Officer Mullaney, Sergeant Good, Sergeant Lank. That'll be a fun cross. Make sure you uh you watch the day that Sergeant Michael Lank is called to the stand. And Sergeant Good, too, because he said, I want to section her. Uh, Lieutenant Paul Gallagher, Lieutenant Charles Ray, Lieutenant Kevin O'Hara, officer and from Dighton Police Department, Officer Nicholas Barros. He was the officer who responded to Karen's parents' house when um, Proctor, I think Buchanan was the one that was with him, called ahead and said they needed I don't know, an escort or something to come to Karen's parents' house in Dighton when they towed the car. Sergeant Brian Gallarani from Needham Police Department. I don't know who that is. We know who that is. Uh, then we have Trooper Evan Brent. Uh, so these guys are also from MSP. Uh, Evan Brent, Trooper DeCastro, Trooper Pye. Trooper Pye was the one that we hear, I believe, in that video where he's talking to Karen. And she says, you're all in on the same joke. And then Captain Eric Benson, also at MSP. Okay, here's the civilian witnesses. And I've, I've made a little chart. I mean, I said I'm not great with charts, but all I did was make notes here so that we can keep these witnesses straight. Um, did you notice, Melanie, that Bev did not state FBI before she said the agent's names? Oh, that's right. She did read out all of the witnesses to the jury, right? We didn't, we didn't watch that part, but no. I mean, why would she, right? All right, here's the civilian witnesses on their list. Heather Maxson, she was the rear seat passenger who was in Richie's car with Ryan Nagel. And then we have from the Canton Fire Department, Anthony Flamati, Dr. Irene Scordi Bello. She is the medical examiner who conducted John's autopsy. And we have Dr. Renee Stonebridge, also of the medical examiner's office. Then from Canton Fire Department, Timothy Nuttall, Francis Walsh, Matthew Kelly, Gregory Woodbury, Katie McLaughlin, who I believe is friends with, correct me if I'm wrong, Caitlin Albert, the daughter of Brian and Nicole Albert, the homeowners, Jason Becker, Daniel Whitley, and Wendell Robbery. Okay. So you mean to tell me this is how many, all these people from the fire department are on scene. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight fire department, either personnel, let's say eight fire department personnel. You've got, um, a number of officers from Canton PD that come to the scene and a leaf blower and Karen's screaming bloody murder, and they don't come out of their house. Really? This is just adding fuel to the fire by calling all of these people. So you were on the scene too? So you're on the, what was the scene like? Was it loud? Was it chaotic? Did you come with sirens? Did you have a fire truck? Were there lights on? It strains credulity that a first responder who owned that home would not come out. When a guy who was invited to his house the night before, a fellow brother in blue, is dead on his front lawn. That strains credulity. And I think a jury's going to think that too. I'm not just lying over here. Okay. And then for those of you who don't know, this is going to be interesting. Because when you really write it down, because if you hear certain people talk on court TV, they're like, oh, these people didn't even really know each other. What do you mean? It's like, it's like his sister knew her brother's first cousin, second cousin's uncle. Like, that's ridiculous. Okay. It's really not ridiculous because here is what it is. And this is true. 
Jennifer McCabe. She is the sister-in-law of Brian Albert, the sister of his wife, Nicole Albert. And she is the one whose phone Googles Haas long to die in cold at 2.27 a.m. She's also friends with John O'Keefe for about 10 years. She doesn't really know Karen. Matthew McCabe is the husband of Jennifer McCabe, and he is the brother-in-law of the homeowners. He was also there at the after party at 34 Fair Fairview. Allison McCabe, um, I need help with this one, is Allison McCabe the daughter of Jen and, and Matt? And was she there also? Was she on scene? Carrie Roberts is an old friend of John O'Keefe. I think she went to the prom with him, some of you have pointed out. Yes. Okay, so so Allison is, is the daughter of Matt and Jen, and was she at the house? Because now there's all of a sudden a lot more people at the house because they didn't really, when they gave their first statements, and you'll see this <laughs> during direct examination, when they were asked who else was there, uh, certain names were left out. Certain names were spelled wrong, people think intentionally, so they couldn't be you know, track down. So Carrie Roberts is an old friend of John O'Keefe's from high school. She went to the prom with him. She called, uh, Karen Reed called her in the morning and there are conflicting reports about whether she went to Jen McCabe's house in the morning or she went to John O'Keefe's house in the morning. So she, there's conflicting reports there. Jen McCabe says one thing. Jen McCabe says, Carrie Roberts came to my house and then followed us back to John's house, which makes no sense. Because why would they go back to John's house when that's where Karen just left? And why would they go back and search there when she just left there? Carrie Roberts says, I went to John's house and met them there. And then we all went to Fairview. So that's going to be interesting. But in any event, she was with Karen and Jen McCabe when John O'Keefe's body was found. Then there's Kurt Roberts. I don't know who that is. I'm going to, do I assume that it's Carrie's brother or Carrie's husband? And what does he have to do with this? Is he going to testify about what Kerry told him? Like, that doesn't seem to be, that's hearsay. Paul O'Keefe is the brother of John O'Keefe. Aaron O'Keefe is the wife of Paul and the sister-in-law of John O'Keefe. The juvenile uh, with the initials KF is the niece of John O'Keefe. She had been in his custody for eight years. She's now 16. Juvenile with the initials PF, he's the nephew of John O'Keefe in his custody for eight years, and he's now 13. People think they were wasting time by going, by taking, going back to John's house. Yep. Mandolin Wind. Yeah, I always wonder why they went back to John's house. Right. She had just been there. She just came from there. She panicked. Dawn says, Karen went to Jen's, then they met Carrie at John's. Right, but that's not what Jen said. That's what I think happened too. But Jen says different, right? Okay, that's Carrie's husband. Thank you, love. Michael Camerano is a friend of John O'Keefe. He was, he was, he went with him to CF McCarthy's, right? On January 28th of 2022. Uh, and then I'm guessing, he also is the one who's going to testify that, uh, another motive for this alleged murder that he testified in front of the state grand jury when Lally asked him about, give, tell us about any arguments that you might know about between John and Karen. So, well, he got mad once because Karen didn't let him fix a plumbing issue at her house. She hired a plumber. So that's his contribution. Um, Catherine Camerano, I imagine that's the wife of Michael. And then here is where it gets a little more interesting for the people who say these people are, what do you mean? How could all these people conspire? Brian Higgins is a federal ATF agent. He was in 34 Fairview at the after party on the date. D of A is just well, date of accident is what I'm going to call it because it's shorthand. He had a romantic interest in Karen Reed. He destroyed his phone in violation of a court order. He actually went to a military base where he broke the phone, smashed the SIM card. Then he lied about, then he he was ordered to preserve his phone. So he smashed it and killed it, killed it, broke the SIM card. He spoke with Brian Albert at 2.22 in the morning, five minutes before the Google search of Haas Long to die in cold and lied about it. That was the butt dialing that we joke about. 
And then he used a federal agent friend to obtain his phone records where he printed out all of the, he had a federal agent friend of his extract only the text messages between him, self and Karen and himself and John O'Keefe. And then he printed those out and brought them with him to, um, I think to the grand jury when he testified. And then he took a federal proffer deal which is in the works. If you don't know what a federal proffer, proffer deal is, federal proffer is offered to someone who has information of a crime that you could potentially be implicated in. And in exchange for your proffer, you're offered either immunity or leniency. That is out there. It is now public. And it seems that Brian Higgins has flipped on his friends and his friends flipped out. And that's why they wanted Brian Albert's cell phone records between Brian Albert, Kevin Albert, and Brian Higgins, because when they got their federal subpoenas, Brian Albert was trying to text Higgins like, what, dude, what, you got a subpoena? Did you get a subpoena? Did you? And he was ghosting him. Higgins was ghosting Albert. So Albert had Kevin, his brother, Canton PD, texting Higgins like, why are why you ghosting my brother? We all got federal subpoenas. Did you get one too? Yeah, it's like a plea deal, kind of. It's kind of like you're offered something in exchange for your testimony. Brian Albert is the homeowner of 34 Fairview, the location of the after party and the scene of John O'Keefe's death. Boston, he's a Boston police officer, and I think he was in the Fugitive Task Force. Don't hold me to that, but something as such similar. He was also on the reality show Boston's Finest. Childhood friends with Trooper Proctor and Sergeant Lank. He's the husband of Nicole, the brother of Kevin, who is a Canton police officer at the time, brother of Chris, who is the father of Colin, wife of Julie, and the, a town selectman currently in Canton. And he's also, Tim is a brother, the one that was in that La, uh, Lapa, Lopa, Lido, Lapa, I forget how to pronounce the name now. Nicole Albert, a.k.a. Coco, is the homeowner at 34 Fairview, the wife of Brian Albert and the sister of Jennifer McCabe, which makes her the sister-in-law of Matt McCabe. And the I think makes her also the sister-in-law of Julie Albert and Chris Albert. Brian Albert Jr. is the son of Brian and Nicole. It was his birthday gathering on the date of the accident at 34 Fairview. I think he was turning 23. Then we have Ian Whiffen. I think he's a forensic. He's a Celebrate guy. Uh, Dr. Justin Rice. So these are good SAM providers. I guess they are going to testify as to the treatment of either Karen or John or both. Dr. Justin Rice, a uh, nurse named Daisy Ormseth, Catherine Wilfert, RN, Dr. Gary Fowler. And then UC Davis Vet Lab. She's the expert, Terry Kahn. Nicholas Bradford from Bodhi Technology. Test chart from Bodhi Technology. That has to do with the hair, not hair. That may come in, may not come in. Don't know if it's a hair. Maybe it's a hair. Maybe it's a human. Maybe it's not. Uh, have they ruled on that? Then there's Julie Albert. She's the wife of Chris, the mother of Colin, the sister-in-law of Brian and Nicole. She texted Proctor's sister on the date of Karen Reed's arraignment, February 2nd of 22, and said that she wants to get Trooper Proctor a thank you gift when, quote, this is all over. Coincidentally, on the same day that Karen was being arraigned. Christopher Albert is the brother of Brian Albert, the husband of Julie, the father of Colin. He's a town selectman and the owner of DE Pizza. Prior to the date of accident, he lived two doors down from John O'Keefe on Meadows Avenue. And he took photos on John O'Keefe's porch with his wife, Julie, when John, uh, of them drinking beer on his porch when John and Karen were in Aruba to taunt him because Colin Albert, the next on the witness list, who is the son of Chris and Julie, the nephew of Brian and Nicole, his name was initially withheld as being at the scene at 34 Fairview at the after party. 
Then when finally it was found out that they had been there, they claimed that he left before John O'Keefe did not arrive. So there was a lot of a lot of back and forth about Colin Albert never being in the house before John O'Keefe never came in the house. You getting that? <laughs> you getting all that? He may have had beef with John O'Keefe regarding beer cans and cutting through his property. That was uh, in open court the other day that um, either Yannetti or Jackson said they have proof of that and they intend to show that at trial. And he was staunchly defended by D.A. Michael Morrissey in that hostage video that we talked about. Ryan Nagel was a passenger in a car that pulled up to 34 Fairview behind Karen Reed. He saw no damage to the taillight, and he saw Karen Reed alone in the car. Tristan Morris is the boyfriend of Caitlin Albert, who was at the waterfall with Caitlin, and then at some point later, he picked up Caitlin at 34 Fairview. I know, it's hard. Listen, go to Brandy Churchwell's website later. After this is over, she's got family trees, she's got charts, she's got it all. I'm just doing this for for our viewing pleasure right now, because I know if you're just joining us, you're going to be confused. Kaylin Albert is the daughter of Brian Albert and Nicole Albert. She is the sister of Brian Jr. She's the niece of, what do I have there? She's the niece of Jen McCabe and Matt McCabe. All right, this is wrong. It's a typo. This is not to be construed as anything other than my own personal notes, which may or may not be correct 100%. But I think I'm doing pretty well so far, Olivia, right? Um, so she's the niece of Jennifer McCabe. The niece of Chris Albert and Julie Albert, the cousin of Colin Albert, she testified that Brian Albert was giving Brian Higgins a tour of the house. I can't remember if she said it was upstairs. I kind of think she said it was on the second floor and she thought that was weird, but I'm not quite sure. And at, at some point she was allegedly picked up at Fairview by her boyfriend, Tristan Morris. Gretchen Voss is the reporter for Boston Magazine that interviewed Karen Reed. Uh, Louis Jutras, I don't know, I don't know who that is. Nicholas Roberts, he's the Massachusetts Office of Alcohol Te Testing. Sarah Levinson was in the house on the night in question. She's a friend of Brian Albert Jr. She was, her name was initially left out of all the police reports. I think, is she the nurse? I don't know. I have a question mark there. Her name was misspelled in the police reports. Uh, she was driven home by Jen McCabe and Matt McCabe with Julie Nagel. I have a question mark there because I'm not quite sure. Yeah, exactly. Yet somehow Lally can get up there and say they don't know each other that well. Everybody's related. Has Gretchen been officially removed from the courtroom? I don't know. Is Lewis lucky? No. Lewis's name is Brian Lochran. If anybody knows who Lewis is, Rob says, and I have no proof of this. This is Rob's opinion. Rob says Sarah Levinson was intimidated by Brian Albert. Yes, she is a registered nurse. Scott, he's coming. He's coming because they have him on the defense witness list. So hang on a second. Wait, is Louis Jutras the cop that Brian Albert punched out? Jeff Spicoli coming in with the deets. I don't know. Anybody know? Christy Reynolds, a painter's daughter, says, this reads like a good soap opera, but I feel like I stepped out to make lunch and now I missed who's related to whom, but I'm still interested. <laughs> um. Andre, so the, then all these people work in the Massachusetts State uh, Police Crime Lab. Andre Porto, Ashley Vallier, Maureen Hartnett, Christina Hanley, Sophie Kreisen. Okay, here's here's the plow driver, number 74, Brian Lachlan, a.k.a. Lucky. Plow driver on the date of the accident. The name uh, was withheld from the defense. He was not interviewed until 18 months later. He did not see the body at 2.30 a.m., but he did see a Ford Edge parked where John O'Keefe was found. It could not plow while it was parked there. 
And like I said earlier, he would have seen a body because he had to point his headlights at where the body was found because there was a, he knew there was a fire hydrant there that he had to avoid and a flagpole and a utility box. Oh, number 75. This is the, the driver of the truck in which Ryan Nagel was a passenger. Richie D'Antuano. Who's Jean Demulis? I don't know who that is. Maybe she was uh, on the Aruba trip. James Sullivan probably was on the Aruba trip too because Marietta was on that trip. Stephen Bernstein of Stoughton. Maybe all these people were in Aruba. Uh, Juliana Nagel is the friend of Brian Albert Jr. and the sister of Ryan Nagel. She was in 34 Fairview on the date of the accident. She was driven home by Jen McCabe and Matt McCabe, although she told her brother Ryan, who came to pick her up, that she was going to sleep over. Nicholas Kolakithis, he was a friend of I don't even know who, but he was one of the people at the waterfall with them. And he said that Karen Reed did not appear intoxicated and there were no fights among any of those people. And then we see, oh, here, interesting, Lindsay. Uh, Gretchen Voss is also a journalist who attended the entire rolling rally. Yet was not charged with witness intimidation, picking a witness or anything else. Yes, he punched out Eddie Hernandez. <laughs> James Sullivan was at the waterfall too. Thank you, Mr. Spicoli. Uh, yes, yes. I would be happy if somebody would link Brandy's channel. Uh, she has a also a podcast um, called The uh, Conspiracy in Canton. And I think she's just finished uh, episode number nine, perhaps. Um, that is an audio only podcast. She posts that also on her channel. She's a great source of information. And then we have Michael Trotta, Rebecca Treyers, a Brigid Mian, or Bridget Mian, Jessica Hyde. I don't know who any of these people are. But I do know that Marietta Sullivan was the Aruba witness who had an alleged kiss with John o with John O'Keefe on New Year's Eve. Oh, that should say 2021. And that she exchanged FUs with Karen in the lobby. And then she thought Karen was an a-hole. And she testified to all that in front of the state grand jury. Karina Kolakithis, she's the wife of, I think, Nicholas. She was also at the Waterfall Bar. Laura Sullivan, I think, is the sister of Marietta, who testified to a whole bunch of hearsay. And then the defendant's witness list is here, attached to another page. So many of the same players here. Brian Albert, Caitlin Albert, Christopher Albert, Colin Albert, Julie Albert, Kevin Albert, Michael Wagner. I did not see him on the other list. I don't know who that is. If anybody knows, you can put it in the chat. Cheryl W-A-U-G-H from Canton. Paul Mikowski, Leslie Bernstein, Rebecca Bazin. I don't know any of those people. Uh, two officers from Dighton PD, Nicholas Barros, and I'm assuming that, and Paul Bedouin. I think they were probably there when the car was towed. Former chief of Canton Police Department, Kenneth Berkowitz, <laughs> because he found a piece of taillight a week later. Trooper Evan Brent and Yuri Buchanan from Massachusetts State Police. Lori Cahill of Worcester. Don't know who that is. Trooper Zachary Clark, MSP. Christopher Curran of Canton. Don't know. Carrie Curran. Don't know. Nicholas Curran. Don't know. Richie D'Antuano. He's the guy who was driving the car that uh, Ryan Nagel was in. Officer Kelly Deaver of the Boston PD. Stephanie Devlin, Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab. David DeChico, MSP. Patrick Haggerty of Dighton. Maureen Hartnett, we know her. She's the one who failed her exam to examine hair under a microscope. Brian Albert Jr., Brian Higgins. Now here's Louis again. Who's Louis? Louis Juttress. Trooper Connor Keefe, MSP, Matthew Kelly, Canton FD, Karina and Nicholas Kolakithis. And then they, we have the veterinary lab expert good. So the defense wants to call her too. They're gonna, gonna cross her. Oh my goodness, this goes on forever. Um, so everyone on here that I can see is already, is also on the other side's list, except Steve Nelson of the Norfolk District Attorney's Office. Oh, here we go. 
Lewis is the town IT guy that handed over the library video. Lindsay coming in with the deets on the sitch. Jennifer Picardi says the Currens are friends of John and Karen. Okay, so Lewis <laughs> is the lab director. Even Olivia is laughing at me. <laughs> Lewis manages the IT for the town of Canton. He oversees the surveillance footage from public town buildings. Okay, so there we go. Sean of the Gulf says 23 is important. Yeah, that's the driver. The driver. Uh, he's also on the Commonwealth's list. So he's the driver who was driving the car that uh, Ryan Nagel was in when they pulled up to 34 Fairview behind Karen. Um, Andre Porto, Steve Nelson, Holly Price from Google. She's probably going to come in and testify about, I'm thinking Google searches or something. Having to do, <laughs> having to do the Google, how's that? <laughs> Trooper Kathleen Prince, Elizabeth Proctor, the wife of Trooper Michael Proctor, and the one who Julie Albert was told to give a gift to. I want to know. She's not on their list, but she's coming in. Uh, I want to know if she got that gift. And I want to know if it was like something good or if it was like something crappy, like one of those like those like Larry and David baskets with the summer sausage that they used to send to our office at Christmas that nobody wanted to eat that summer sausage. <laughs> or was it like something good? Like, um, I don't know. What's a good thing to get through the mail? No, look at my post about Holly Price. Okay, we'll go. We'll go there next. We have so much information. This is why we're on here for hours and hours and hours because we're not we're not just doing a, a shallow a shallow dive on this. We're doing a deep dive. Okay. Oh, thanks for sharing the stream, Olivia. Um, all right. Holly Price, what will she be called to testify about? Says Olivia. In my estimation, potentially either the Google Nest camera at Brian Albert's house or the Google Geofence preservation requests. And I'm reading from Olivia's tweet. Seems more likely this witness would be called to enter into evidence the records of correspondence regarding any Google Nest cameras installed at the crime scene or Brian Albert's house at 34 Fairview. Seems unlikely the defense would call this witness if the return from Google yielded no Google Nest camera set up or in use at Brian Albert's house on January 29th, 2022. That's right. They they claimed that they he got the Google Nest system for Christmas but hadn't set it up yet, right? Oh, yes. You are an evil genius. Yeah, they need, like I said, they need people to authenticate records and that could very well be. If so, this witness would also likely be called to enter said relevant records pertaining to the existence of said Google Nest cameras into evidence. The information or records requested by the defense in their original motion included the following. Setup information related to any Google Nest camera or associated account registered to Brian Albert or Nicole Albert for their residence located at 34 Fairview. Service usage data for any Nest camera activated prior to the 29th. Any audio or video data. Oh, that's good stuff. That could be true. Make sure you go to Olivia Lambo on Twitter so you can read this whole entire thing for yourself. Oh. Huh. Yeah. How did the defense learn about the Google Nest cameras at Brian Albert's house, you ask? Well, Olivia will tell you. And she even has a clip from the September 15th motions hearing where Judge Canoni interrupted in the middle of his argument, as always, or as sometimes. Trooper Michael Proctor, Carrie Roberts, Wendell, and then all of these guys from the fire department and ladies and Heriberto Hernandez. Did somebody say that's the cop that um, Brian O'Keefe I mean, Brian Albert punched in the face. Hmm. That'll be a fun twist of events or interesting twist of events. And the Lopalato brothers are going to come in and testify about their lawsuit.
Uh, Angela Malvone, I'm not sure who that is. She might have been a witness to the Lopalito incident. I don't know. That's the cop that Brian Albert punched. Wow. You guys know so much. I love that this is like an interactive, collaborative channel. And you help me with the details because I can't know everything. I just can't. My brain is so full to the brim. So I have, I have no room left for the minutia. So I never worry about minutia because I just can't. I have no room left. Courtney Proctor. So that is the sister of Trooper Proctor. She has the wedding photos. Colin Albert was her ring bearer. And she has the text with, uh, I have J.A. here, but I think it's Jennifer McCabe, right? Jennifer McCabe. No, Julie Albert. That's what it is. Julie Albert. She was texting with Julie Albert when Julie Albert said, when this is all over, I want to get your brother a gift. And then she texted her brother that. And her brother, Michael Proctor, said, tell her to get my wife a gift instead. Tristan Morris, he's the boyfriend of Caitlin. Jean DeMullis, Mary Sousa, Ashley Bell, Mike Rushworth, Matthew Armory, Norfolk County District Attorney Michael Morrissey. I love that. They're going to call him in. They're going to put him on the stand and they're going to question him about that video. He made a lot of statements in that video about Colin Albert never being in that house. And that could turn out to be a lie if he knew that he really was in the house. This is and, and by saying that Proctor never went to the scene when there's police reports and other records that he did go to the scene, he, he made himself a witness. He inserted himself as a witness in this case. He has nobody to blame but himself. Thomas Beatty is a friend of John O'Keefe's who was called by, I think, uh, Jim McCabe, right? And maybe Karen Reed even called him to see if he knew where John O'Keefe was. I'm not sure. Uh, Aaron Beatty, I think, is his wife. Megan Man Thomas, well, Megan Mariani and Thomas Martin. I uh, don't know who they are, but John O'Keefe Sr. is the father of John O'Keefe, and he's on the defense witness list. I don't know what that means. So I need to come to you. And then they're experts. And, and Olivia did a deep dive. I'm going to refer you to her Twitter to go look at her Twitter. She did a deep dive on every single one of these witnesses and what they're likely going to testify to and what their backgrounds are. So please, please go there at Olivia Lambo, L-A-M-B-O. On the defense expert witnesses list, there's a Dr. Sheridan, forensic pathologist. There is a biomechanical engineer, Chris Van E, Richard Green, digital forensics, Daniel Wolf, Andrew Rentschler, Scott Klein. And Olivia has done that work for me, so I can rest in my voice for a little while. I mean, I think we're going to have to come back tomorrow because we've already been at it for two and a half hours. We still haven't even looked at the um, jury questionnaire. And I think there's going to be some more stuff that's probably going to drop. And you guys sent me a defense exhibit list. So we can do that. I mean, I know you're going to miss me by tomorrow. And what are we going to do? We're going to do nothing until Friday or Monday? We can't. What do you think? All right. Uh, Mello, I did not see Mello on the list. Oh, and it was three separate PhDs and not one person with three PhDs. Oh, you're talking about the accident reconstructionist. Yeah, the FBI accident. You think that was the FBI trained accident reconstructionist that they're going to call? I mean, it's quite possible. It's quite possible. Jimmy's like, don't leave us. Jimmy's still mad at me because he got accidentally blocked the other night. I took care of it. I told you I would take care of it. There it is. Thanks, little cupcake. Brandy Churchwell, 13th juror, is a great source of info on YouTube. And then if you go to her website, I think she's got all of the charts and the graphs and the family trees and who's married to who, who's related to who. Come back tomorrow. Some people are like, I'm hungry. I am outraged. I am outraged. Uh, progress with regards to jury selection. Craig, uh, yes, they have 11 jurors and they need to have five more because they need 12 for the jury and four alternates. So I think tomorrow they will finish. I still don't really have an answer on whether or not they're going to open on Friday or Monday because the judge had said there's not there's no jurors on Fridays. But they did say during trial they're going to have full days Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I don't know if they will give, if she will give them the weekend to open on Monday. I don't know. 
Lisa says Olivia and Lauren are two of the best out there. Kay Healy says John O'Keefe info about his dad and Karen must be true. Well, there was some uh, information that surfaced yesterday that said <clears throat> that there were a bunch of court, court officers who said, that's like double, triple hearsay. I mean, I don't know. But that perhaps uh, Mr. O'Keefe wanted to switch over to Sonat and Karen's side of the courtroom. I can't verify that. I don't know if it's true, but I think that's what you're talking about. But the fact that the defense put him on the witness list means that he can't really be in the courtroom. So, uh, oh, yes, that's right. Chloe's mom. They have to do background checks on all the jurors, all 16. So the trial will be on Monday. Thank you. We get to rest for the weekend. Get to rest. So after tomorrow, then we will have three more days than a wake up. Kate says, please let justice prevail. Cindy, is anyone surprised that Turtle Boy is not in any list from either side? That is a very interesting point. Did she rule that none of that stuff could come in? I, did she ever rule on that motion? Because remember, they wanted all that stuff in. They turned over grand jury transcripts and stuff from Aiden's case. But for those of you who don't know, Aiden Carney, a.k.a. Turtle Boy, uh, is a YouTuber, blogger, journalist who has done tremendous deep dive into this case and was arrested on witness intimidation charges and spent 60 days in jail. I'm not going to go into like the charges and all the stuff that happened because I'm number one, I'm not really sure about all of it. Um, but he has said that he was protecting his First Amendment rights and he didn't want to take a plea. And he spent 60 days in jail. But yeah, they tried, they they turned over all that stuff. I thought they wanted him in. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Cindy says, I'm surprised because he talked to witnesses. One example is Lucky. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Maureen said, oh, that's what it was. That's right. Both sides agreed to exclude it. I remember now because we watched them argue this. And then she said, well, just because you want to exclude it doesn't mean that I will. And then Alan Jackson said to her, oh, does that mean that you're going to start introducing evidence or something? It was crazy. Both the DA and the defense didn't want it in, but Bev does, so it's allowed. I mean, who's going to introduce it? If nobody introduces it, it doesn't come into evidence. Am I missing something here? What am I missing? Lauren, there's normally an exception to family. However, I haven't heard either way. I think they did, I think they did make a request that the family could sit in after they testify. But, and they and they wanted that to be for Paul, the brother, the two children, and, I, and Mr. O'Keefe, now that he's on the list. Am I surprised Chief Rafferty isn't on the list? No, because she wasn't the, she wasn't the chief during the time in question. So I don't really know how she'd be relevant. Madam Roz, yeah, joint motion to exclude his case, but she overruled them due to witness. How's it going to come in? Oh, that's is that when she said, oh, well, if a witness naturally brings it up, then I'm going to let it in. And she gave kind of like the green light, right, for the witnesses to bring it up. That's right. You know, I've been covering this uh, terrible case out of Oklahoma panhandle at the same time as this one. So my brain's a little bit fried. Um. Lindsay says, Bev wants uh, Jen to be able to use it as an excuse to be able to say she was at Proctor's house because of the intimidation, right? Because they have pictures of her car at Trooper Proctor's house. That's correct. That is correct. Correct. 
Let me just go to my phone for a second and see if we have any other information here because we will have to come back either tomorrow or it's tomorrow. Tomorrow's Thursday already. Yeah, I think we'll wrap. We can do this tomorrow or Friday. Olivia's Twitter is at Olivia Lambo, L A M B O. Thank you, Donna and Robert and Nancy and Lisa and Stacy. Uh, for thanking me and for contributing to the channel. And you guys are amazing and very, very kind. And Amber and Mary. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I think we should break this into two streams because, you know, at this point we all start getting a little punch drunk. And that way it gives you some uh, some time to think about some more questions and you can go and read Olivia's Twitter feed and then you can look at Brandy's charts and then a lot of you who are new can get a working knowledge of this case before we start <laughs> piling it on because I'm telling you, it's a lot. It is a lot. Uh, and did you guys see, oh yeah, I think I said it already about the community post I made today about that Fox coverage. Kelch isn't on the list. I want. I wanted to know that too. Yeah. Kelch, Matt Kelch is the one, the Fed, that he that Higgins had uh, used his resources to get the text messages. Why? Yeah, why isn't he on the list? I know. Curious about that. Curiouser and curiouser. Huh. Hmm. Let's see. I'm going to swipe through here and see if any of you. You're right. The Corey checks have to be done. So then we have to come back Monday. Uh, for those who are, new, who are new, I have like at least 25 or 26 videos on this case. You can start right from the beginning. There's a playlist. Go back and check it out. Come back here. Thank you, Patronus Glow, for putting up Olivia's Twitter. <laughs> uh, Debbie says, get ready. What a trial this will be. Daybell trial is so boring. Because <laughs> I guess because we've kind of seen it all with Lori Vallow, right? And the, 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 the camera, the feed is bad. Banksy, how do I feel about them putting the kids on the stand? I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a fan. You know, I'm not a fan because I don't think the kids have a whole lot to add. You know, the kids are going to say, oh, they were arguing. We heard them arguing. They're arguing a lot. But, you know, if you know, this is something these kids are going to have to live with, they've already lost both their parents. Now they've lost John, who was Uncle JJ to them. And now if they testify, first of all, it's traumatic. They're 16 and 13, but still it's traumatic to have to testify in a courtroom full of people with cameras. Like they haven't even said if they're going to, sometimes what they do with juvenile witnesses is they'll, they'll have them testify in a back room on camera and then they'll have the video feed in the courtroom. But, you know, they're going to have to get up in front of all these people, most of whom are strangers, media, a camera, and be questioned. And then what if, if Karen's convicted and then they, they, have regrets later about what they said and they feel responsible for her being convicted. I mean, I think that's a lot to put on the kids because they're not really adding anything. You know, the kids saying that, oh, we heard uh, Uncle JJ and Karen arguing, you know, for uh, two weeks before. And uh, Uncle JJ was mad because Karen uh, bought me an, a Dunkin' Donuts before school. I mean, what is it adding? To me, I, I think the, the, the harm to the children is way worse than the value to this case. I don't see the value. I'm, feel free to disagree with me and let me know what you think. But I don't, I don't like it. This will be interesting because you know every witness will be watching the stream. They're not supposed to. They're not supposed to watch any coverage. Witnesses are going to say they were at Proctor's house because of the harassment of Turtle Boy. Yeah. Oh, she was the acting chief, Helen Rafferty, at the time? Oh, because Berkowitz was on medical leave. Hmm. You know, you can always add witnesses too. As long, I mean, you're not locked and loaded on that list. I mean, maybe you are in Massachusetts again. I don't know. Jimmy says, Jimmy says, you are awesome. <gasps> this is a Seinfeld reference, right? Thanks, Jimmy. 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 Ha, <laughs> ha,
<laughs> Mandalay Wynn, thank you for the super cart. Super, super cart, super cart, super chat. Thank you so much, gorgeous and wicked smart. Wicked smart, we love you. I love you too. Cheryl, thank you so much for your super chat. You're a moderator and you are amazing. Della says, Chris Maloney is from Virginia, where I'm from. Got it. Yeah, like Chris Maloney. Elliot Stabler. Where's Elliot Stabler when you need him? Sandy B. Thanks, Sandy B. For your super chat. Who gave Higgins and Albert permission to destroy phones? Can't wait for that answer. Oh, maybe that's why they're calling Marcy to the stand. That's a good point. That's a good point. Or there could be wiretapped conversations that the feds have. That is a good point. Patty, thank you for your super chat. Thank you for your shows. And thank you to Kim, the boss lady RN on Sean's show. I would want her caring for me from a fellow RN. Oh, nurse power. My mom's a nurse too. Nurses are very special. Nurses don't get enough credit. Because really, when you have a hospital stay, when you're an inpatient in a hospital, it's all about the nursing. It's all about the nursing. Because the doctor only comes to see you, like, hardly ever. And it's all about your nurse. And the nurses are amazing. And you guys do amazing work. And you are much needed. Uh, let's see. Dawn. Hi, Dawn. Uh, thanks for your super chat. Shelly made a great comment. Did they test John's shoes for dog DNA? That's great. Yes, because you're right. When I was researching that uh, dog DNA expert... She did have an article about how they could get dog DNA from dog do that they found at the scene if a perp stepped in the dog do. Dog do. I saw my mother. <laughs> Hi, mom. If you're watching, she's in her 80s and she still calls it dog do. Uh, yeah, good point. But yeah, interesting. Or dog hair. There could have been evidence of a dog on his hair, on his shoes, for sure. He was in the house. John, we are writing the defense right here. We are writing it. And Suzanne, thank you again. I already thanked you for this one, I believe. Whew, I'm exhausted. Are you guys exhausted? <laughs> Michelle says, so if they don't get five jurors tomorrow, we will be back Monday for jury selection. Yes, because they do not have jurors on Friday. Those kids have gone through enough trauma. I agree with you. I agree 100%. I'm always, always, always about the kids and always, always about the victim. And in this case, it is about John O'Keefe. <laughs> Uh, you haven't been with me until I've swiped myself out of the stream. <laughs> I go like this and it swipes me out. What is it? The Islanders are playing Scott and you're watching me? 2-1, second period. All right, well, you already made the playoffs, right? So the Rangers, the Islanders, and the Bruins all going to the playoffs. It's going to be such great hockey. Although I think, Scott, you told me that Rangers are playing the uh, the Capitals, which is... Uh, I don't know how good they are this year, but I've been to Capitals. I've been to the Cap Center. I've been down there for games, and they are very kind to Ranger fans. Unlike, sorry if I'm offending anyone's team, but uh, the Canes fans went there for playoffs one year. And um, Okay, I think it's time to leave because I did it again. StreamYard needs to take a meeting with me because um, that should not be allowed to happen. I'm just going on my little mouse pad and it swipes me out. Okay, um, okay, Bruins are playing Toronto. Toronto. The Canes are crazy. Yeah, and you know what else about the Canes? While we're on the Canes, they have one chance. One chance. Like, let's go, Canes. That's like it. That's all they say. And they scream it and they're yelling and the whole time. And I don't like it. They need to get some new chance. So I'm just saying. Swiper, stop swiping. Who are the Bruins playing? Oh, Montreal, right? Or or Maple Leafs? Or somebody told me. <laughs> I can't <just> doing it. <laughs> I do. I need sleep. I need to boys. The YouTube gods are coming. They're coming for me. I can't say Norfolk. Or they, they strike me for the cursey words. Toronto? Toronto? Yes, it is. It is. Dora. It's a Dora. The Caps fans. 
I thought the Canes fans are worse than the Cavs fans. Got to say. Been to Cap Center and whatever they call it. I think it's the Cap Center, right? They were nice to me. But Canes fans, not so much. In any event. Um, you guys are amazing. Thank you to my mods for being so classy and for keeping the chat so classy. And I think it was you, it was a really good crowd tonight. And you guys were awesome. If you're just here for the first time, be sure to leave a comment below the video and like let us know what you thought and how you liked it. And welcome in. It would really help the channel if you would hit the subscribe button because it helps push, push the video out and it's free. Uh, and if you hit the bell, you'll get notified when I go live, which is a very random schedule that I have. And sometimes it's like last minute. So if you don't want to miss a thing, be sure to hit the bell and set the notifications on your phone so you will get them. Um, my members, you are amazing. My little cupcakes love you all so much. And viewers, replay viewers, you guys are amazing. You're just great. Um, this is a crazy case and we're here for it. And thank you to the mods. And just like, remember, because um, it's really not hard. Be cool, be kind, be classy. Like, it's really not hard. It is so not hard. Peace. See you tomorrow or the next day. But you got to keep just watching the posts and hit the bell. And I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Good night, everyone.